This happened to me a few years back. At the time, I worked a soul-sucking corporate job with hours that left me little time for actual life. Sarah, my wife, convinced me I needed a vacation. I didn't agree. What were a few days away going to change? Still, after much nagging, I grudgingly put in for time off. Our travel options with such short notice were limited. Flights anywhere fun were exorbitant, but a couple named Blake and Amelia on an RV rental site were practically giving theirs away on short notice. I'd never driven that big of a vehicle, but it seemed easy enough. Sarah booked it before I could object further. Maybe some fresh air and time outdoors would be what I needed after all. Our destination was decided for us too. Blake and Amelia suggested Sequoia National Park in California. They offered glowing references, stunning trails, towering trees, the whole bit. And the idea of spending time near those gargantuan sequoias did pique my interest. It promised to be something unique. I'm Evan, by the way. We picked up the RV on a scorching summer afternoon. Inside was nicer than I expected, all cozy and well-stocked. After a crash course from Blake on operation, we were hesitantly on our way. Sarah drove first. That alone took some edge off my tension. Sequoia was amazing. I admit, seeing those ancient massive trees brought something close to awe. We spent two days wandering trails, losing signal on our phones, cooking dinners outdoors on the little campsite stove. There was laughter. That felt weird. We were happy. Or at least as close to it as I'd been in years. I started to understand what Sarah meant about finding myself again. My corporate worries slowly drifted away. Day three. That's when things turned. We'd tackled a strenuous hike early returning to the campsite exhausted. I took over the wheel for the short trip to our next site while Sarah made lunch. About halfway there, I noticed a truck pulled off behind a grove of trees, maybe a quarter mile down the road. Nothing weird, right? People stop. But in the rearview mirror, I saw someone step out from behind those trees. Tall guy, thin, binoculars in his hands. At first, I thought he was a bird watcher. Then it hit me. Sarah was making sandwiches in the back. He couldn't see her. My gut twisted. Something wasn't right. Evan, the view up here is beautiful. Pull over, Sarah called out. My foot hesitated over the gas. That guy didn't feel like a bird watcher. Not the way he moved. Not the way he held the binoculars. I didn't answer Sarah, just pushed down harder on the accelerator. It wasn't much but I was glad the RV had some pickup. My hands clenched the wheel tight. Evan? Why aren't you... Oh, God! Sarah had spotted him too in the side mirror. Panic set in. A mile past our turn, there was a small rest area. I skidded into it, my heart pounding against my ribs. We slammed the doors shut, locking them in a single motion. Sarah huddled up against me and we could feel rather than see his truck rumble past. He didn't stop. We stayed there, breathless, for what felt like hours. He wasn't after us, I told myself. Just a coincidence. He wasn't coming back, but my mouth was dry with fear. That night, Sarah and I barely slept. Every creak of the RV, every rustling branch, put us on edge. I wished I'd brought a gun or learned hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hell, anything to feel something less than helpless. Sarah kept asking if we should head home, and a voice told me she was right. Yet a stubborn defiance, and the guilt of ruining her longed-for getaway, kept me from agreeing. Next morning, everything was unnaturally still. The air buzzed with wrongness. I had this sick feeling in my gut. A certainty that he was out there, watching us, just waiting. I finally agreed to drive, my grip on the steering wheel so tight my knuckles went white. At the first ranger station we burst in, desperate to report what happened. Their faces were a strange mix of confusion and pity. You see folks disappear. Happens every year, the older ranger said with a resigned sigh. People, 
Sometimes they want to start fresh elsewhere, or they think they can live off the land with no plan. Some accidents out there, too. Terrain gets rough. But we saw... Sarah tried to argue, then trailed off. Of course, they wouldn't believe us. It sounded crazy, and frankly, I was starting to have my doubts about how real yesterday even was. Stress can play tricks on the mind. This happened to me a couple of years ago. An avid hiker, an overall nature enthusiast, I always dragged my less outdoorsy friends out into the wilderness for weekends away from the city. This time, it was me, my college buddy Rhett, his roommate Evander, and my ever-patient girlfriend Brielle. Yosemite National Park was the chosen spot, I know, cliché, but those granite cliffs always leave me in awe. I'm Nash, by the way. I work as a graphic designer, which doesn't exactly contribute to wilderness survival skills, but there you have it. Anyway, with everyone piled into the RV and my playlist blaring, we hit the road. I won't bore you with the trip details. Camp was set up near a river, overlooking El Capitan, prime real estate. We even made some s'mores that first night, before I crashed early under a canvas of stars. Early morning hikes are my preferred thing. There's nothing like that brisk mountain air before the crowds roll in. The next day, however, something was off. I stumbled upon a discarded campsite, tent still up, backpack open, sleeping bag torn on the ground. There were some things strewn about, but nothing looked like anyone had packed up and left on purpose. My initial thought was that it might have been some sloppy hikers abandoning their gear. Still, that nagging feeling that something was wrong wouldn't let up. A little further along the trail, I found what looked like a blood stain on a rock. My stomach dropped. The others were still back at camp, none of them the type to wander off before their morning coffee. By now, panic was setting in. I was about to turn back when a sudden movement across the river caught my eye. Someone, a man I think, was crouched close to the water's edge. Couldn't make out much except messy hair and a ragged flannel shirt sticking out from beneath a camouflaged tarp. Figuring any person right now was potentially a good thing, I yelled out. The man whipped his head up and stood frozen for a second. It wasn't just his look. Unwashed, disheveled, like someone who'd spent a long time surviving off the land. That startled me. His eyes. They held a coldness I had never seen before in another human being. Before I could think, he vanished into the trees. Something told me the woods weren't safe. Not now. Back at camp, I told my friends. At first, they chalked it up to me being jumpy in the wilderness, but then I showed them the abandoned camp and the bloodstain. As we looked back at where I'd seen the strange man, we noticed something... off. Something was hanging from the branches. Too far away to tell, but... It looked like a pair of hiking boots strung oddly high in the tree. Now, the chilling reality washed over us. Our plan was, naturally, to get out of there. Just pack up and go. That was when we heard it, a gunshot echoing through the valley. Evander was always the quick-thinking one. He yelled, Get in the RV! Don't even pack! I didn't argue. Piled in, engine roaring we tore down that dirt road faster than should be legal. My girlfriend, bless her soul, had enough presence of mind to call 911, even as I fumbled with the GPS to try and pinpoint our location. It took a while for the rangers to reach us, and once they did, all we could do was give a shaky description of the campsite and the man. There was a search, of course. Hikers always go missing in a vast wilderness like Yosemite, and most times there's a simple explanation. This time, they didn't find anyone. They did, however, find bloody clothing remnants further into the woods, too far from any established trail to be a casual wanderer. Whoever he was, the strange man we saw, I doubt the missing hikers just went off trail. 
we still hear about hikers going missing in that part of the park now and then. Nobody talks about the wild-eyed man with the empty stare, but I believe that whoever, or whatever, is out there is connected. I try not to think about it, but some nights I can't help but stare out my window and imagine those cold eyes fixed upon me from the darkness. I had just finished a tedious day at work, barely containing a sigh of relief as I stepped out of my office building. It was June 2011, and I was in desperate need of a vacation. A buddy of mine, Leonard Jeffries, suggested we drive to Moosehead Lake in the northeast region of Maine for some weekend fishing and relaxation. We made a pit stop at a general store near the lake, stocking up on food supplies and basic necessities. While waiting in line, I overheard an elderly couple discussing their grandson who hadn't returned home last night. Not wanting to think too much into it, I paid for our goods and we made our way. Leonard recommended an isolated spot further down the bank where we could set up camp. Upon arriving, it felt unsettlingly quiet with only the sound of crickets echoing in the darkness. We decided to call it a night and zipped open our sleeping bags inside our tents. The following night was different. Leonard had caught a trout, but had trouble cutting it due to his dull knife. Frustrated, he looked around for something sharp before letting out a half-hearted chuckle. Hey, Parker, why don't you go give those creepy kids your knife? They've gotten good use out of theirs. He gestured behind me. I turned to see two children standing about twenty feet away from us wearing hoodies that covered most of their faces, except for their eyes, eerie black orbs that captured my attention like a magnet. As they approached us, I could feel my heart rate increasing with each step they took toward us. Everything about these kids exuded menace. Hey, you guys all right? Leonard called out weakly. The children stopped about six feet away but didn't respond. Their eyes were locked on us as if hunting prey. Before I could muster up any words to utter, they slowly advanced toward us. My instincts screamed for me to run, but my legs froze in place. The little girl suddenly raised her arm and pulled a knife from her jacket, letting out a disarming giggle. Leonard and I glanced at each other in complete shock as they stood inches away. We prayed for some unforeseen hero or intervention, but deep down we knew help would not arrive. The little girl with the knife took a step closer, and Leonard and I knew we had to act. Without speaking, we nodded to each other and he grabbed the nearest loose rock about the size of a softball. I picked up a sturdy stick I found nearby. Leonard threw the rock at the boy, hitting his arm and causing him to visibly flinch. Simultaneously, I swung the stick at the little girl's hand that held the knife. The knife flew out of her grasp, landing several feet away. The kids stared at us for a moment, their black eyes seeming to grow darker with anger before they charged at us. We both fought off our fear and made a quick decision to split up and run in separate directions. We hoped it would divide them and buy us some time to get help. As I ran, my heart pounded wildly in my chest, but I couldn't even concentrate on where I was going due to how terrifying the situation was. On top of that, I couldn't call for help since there was no cell phone reception in the area. After what felt like an eternity of sprinting through trees and bushes, I suddenly stumbled upon a small cabin. Without thinking twice, I dashed inside and yelled for whoever may be there, hoping beyond hope someone would hear my desperate cry for help. Perhaps luck was on my side as an older man emerged from another room, concern etched across his face. Gasping for breath, I stumbled over my words trying to explain what had happened how Leonard and I were attacked by seemingly dangerous children. The man didn't hesitate. Instead, he immediately dialed for help on his landline phone. As we waited for assistance to arrive, we watched as two vehicles approached, one police car with lights flashing and another with members of Leonard's family who were also camping nearby. Among them were Leonard, 
who had apparently managed to outrun the boy with black eyes. Filled with relief at seeing each other alive, we shared the terrifying tale of our encounter. As the police began their search for the two children, Leonard and I were taken back to our campsite by his family. The following day, the authorities conducted a thorough search of the area, but found no trace of the two mysterious children. It was as if they had simply vanished into thin air. Although Leonard and I were grateful for our lives, we couldn't help but be haunted by those eerie black eyes. And despite our best efforts to put that terrifying experience behind us, every time we ventured into the woods or heard children's laughter, an icy chill would travel down our spines. As time passed, no new sightings or incidents involving the children were reported in that region. The story began to fade from people's minds, and life went on as usual. But deep down, Leonard and I knew those children were still out there somewhere, waiting for their next chance to strike. I always took pride in being a man of science, the kind who requires empirical evidence before jumping to conclusions. That was until I found myself amid an incident that defied all logic. I, Caspian Holloway, worked for the U.S. government at a secluded facility in the dense forests near Hoodsport, Washington. Unpopular as my name might be, my existence became far less significant when compared to the harrowing ordeal that would unfold at my workplace. It was just another day at the lab. Sterile white walls echoed with the hum of machinery conducting secret genetic experiments. My colleagues, each bearing similarly obscure names like Dr. Theta Kellerman and Agent Lyle Creedy, were immersed in their intricate tasks. That placidity was violently disrupted when Lyle burst into the lab, pallid and panting, his eyes wide with terror. Something's out there! He managed to choke out between gasps. Theta scoffed lightly. Maybe Bigfoot came for a visit? But her attempt to lighten the mood fell flat on our anxiety-riddled minds. In all my years working there, nestled among whispers of eldritch wildlife and old wives' tales, not once had we encountered more than an occasional bear. But Lyle wasn't one for unfounded claims. His fear felt tangible. With firearms at our disposal as standard protocol for researchers in remote locations, we agreed to investigate outside under the assumption that it could be a trespasser jeopardizing our clandestine work. Emerging into the dimming light under the canopy of towering pine trees, we tread carefully on a blanket of fallen needles. Somewhere beyond our visual thresholds lurked a presence, silent but oppressive. It started subtly. A few mangled rabbits here, their bones fractured so precisely it seemed surgical. Black bears can be real scavengers, I remarked dryly when Dr. Kellerman's brow furrowed at the sight of a shredded fox not far from where we stood. The further we ventured from the safety of our facility, spattered blood began painting a gruesome breadcrumb trail towards something worse than we could have fathomed. A partially devoured deer lay sprawled before us its entrails strewn across leaves and soil like grotesque confetti, and its somber eyes still open in silent scream. What could do this? Theta whispered, as she knelt to inspect the grisly scene with an analytical gaze reserved previously for petri dishes and not nature's mangled canvases. Our answer came sooner than expected. Movement rustled through the brush with a deliberate slowness, Heavy steps that birthed shudders upon delicate fallen leaves. Steps that sounded... calculated. We never saw it fully. Only glimpses of antlers that seemed unnatural in both size and shape attached to what should have been a creature from childhood nightmares or forgotten lore. Its breath was audible against the backdrop of our hastening heartbeats. Ragged and heaving like bellows stoking some internal fire fueled by malice rather than wood. None dared shout for help knowing well that radio signals faltered in these woods, and doing so would likely sign our demise by drawing unwelcome attention from this entity whose very existence mocked our understanding of nature. 
Is this some genetic experiment gone wrong? Lyle pondered aloud with no trace of his earlier jesting tone while gripping his pistol so tightly his knuckles whitened. Before any of us could frame a response or theory that didn't sound torn from pages of pulp fiction, it struck with such ferocity it seemed personal, not merely animalistic hunger, but something relentlessly vindictive. A blur of shadowy fur punctuated by unnervingly intelligent eyes charged towards Agent Creedy, who had hardly enough time to raise his weapon before being barreled over by strength no mere man possessed, his screams punctuating what would become an erased afternoon amidst federal secrets. What happened next was chaos incarnate. Gunfire erupted as seconds transformed into desperate eternities where survival hung by frayed threads. Threads tugged mercilessly by a folklore specter turned flesh and blood antagonist whose name remained unspoken, yet felt ancient upon tongues too numbed by fear to even whisper them. We scattered. Lyle and I dashed behind the dense trunks. Bullets from Creedy's gun followed by a sharp yelp told us he'd hit the creature, but not for long. The woods echoed with its growls and snapping branches. Radio won't work, and that thing's between us and the trucks, Lyle gasped, catching his breath. Agent Creedy wasn't visible anymore. The implication was clear, but neither of us vocalized it. Our hope had vanished with him. We moved, counting on silence over speed to keep us hidden. Then it struck again, targeting us with terrifying precision. A wall of muscle hit me from behind, knocking the wind out of my lungs and sending my radio flying out of reach. Through blurred vision, I saw it, broad shoulders, matted hair like a bear, but its face, that face was wrong, twisted features that no bear has. It didn't linger. It seemed satisfied with the damage done. Through sheer will, I got to my knees, saw Lyle motionless a few yards away, his leg bent at an unnatural angle. Radio too far. Yells would tempt fate. We knew this creature tracked sound. With muscles protesting, I half-dragged myself and Lyle towards a nearby cave we'd passed earlier. There was no rescue plan. This wasn't about heroics. This was about surviving one more minute, then another. We spent what felt like hours in the cave's mouth as daylight started to fade outside. The creature prowled nearby, we heard it in the way leaves crunched and branches broke under its weight. When darkness finally settled and animal sounds resumed their nightly chorus, we realized, whatever this creature was, it had withdrawn, perhaps sated or called by some unknown instinct back into the depths of the forest. With dawn came silence, an eerie kind that spoke of emptiness. Somehow during those harrowing hours, while we laid there hoping for obscurity over discovery, Whatever hunted us lost interest, or moved on to other unseen business within these cursed woods. Profitless to linger on what must have happened to Creedy, or how this incident would be scrubbed from official records, we focused only on escape. Crawling and limping with what strength remained in our battered bodies, we found our way back to base camp by mid-morning. Help arrived shortly after our story spilled out in frantic bursts agents documenting every detail while medics looked after injuries that would take more than time to heal. They treated Lyle seriously, his leg broken so severely it may never regain full strength again. Creedy. There was nothing left but a memory that would haunt me long after protocols erased evidence of his existence. In debriefings that followed where reasoning stumbled over logic's edge into realms unexplored by laws of science or understanding, Rooted in reality as we knew it, they labeled the encounter a tragic animal attack, a tale so mundane it insulted those who endured it. Yet as I sit here now, away from those woods that hide a truth none ought to know, a truth glimpsed in dark fur and unnaturally knowing eyes, I understand why some encounters defy explanation, why some secrets insist upon remaining just so for sanity's sake more than anything else. Lyle spends his days in recovery. He doesn't walk yet without support. Creedy's family mourns a lost son courtesy of some unfortunate mishap. 
As for me, there are things best left unspoken things, seen only within boundaries where shadows cast longer than life itself, where creatures dwell which bear no name, lest calling forth invites recurrence. And quiet endures, a silence not empty but filled with whispers among trees between lulling winds, not unlike sighs from spirits whose stories remain unsung outside boundaries of these woods wherein I now refuse entry. This happened to me on July 23, 1993. It's burned into my brain like a brand. I live out in the Ozarks, always have, not many people around, which suits me fine. I hunt, fish, got a little garden out back, used to work construction in Branson, but I'm getting too old for that. Off the grid ain't glamorous, but a man makes do. My name's Hank, Hank Lowry. That day started like any other. Up before dawn, made some coffee, strong as it takes to wake the dead. Took my old hound Sadie out for a walk in the woods behind the house. We've done that same trail a thousand times. Sadie sniffs out squirrels. I check the snares I keep set. It's a routine. This day, though, something felt off. Air was thick, heavy. Sadie kept looking back at me, whining soft like she was worried. Figured she sensed a storm rolling in. Dogs do that. Should have listened to her. I've lived out here all my life. But the woods can still turn on you if you aren't careful. That's when I saw the first sign something wasn't right. Snare trap was twisted out of shape. Wire snapped clean. Now I've seen animals do some damage, but this was unnatural. I called for Sadie, but she was gone. I started getting that prickly feeling on the back of my neck. Whatever did this was big. I went deeper into the trees, keeping my shotgun ready. The silence was worse than any noise. Usually the woods are full of sounds, rustling leaves, birds, the crick bubbling by. But that day, it was dead quiet, like even the crickets held their breath. Suddenly, I heard Sadie bark. It was a scared kind of bark. Found her at the edge of a ravine, cornered, growling at something just out of sight. Then, I heard a low snarl, not like any animal I knew. I crept closer, heart thumping so loud I thought it'd give me away. That's when I saw it. Crouched on its haunches, it was taller than me, even hunched over. Its body looked starved, skin clinging too tight to its bones, stretched over limbs that bent the wrong way. But the face, Lord help me, the face. It was like a dog's skull, stretched long with a jaw full of jagged teeth, dripping with something black and foul. But the eyes, those weren't animal eyes. They were filled with a cold hunger that sent chills down my spine. It lunged at Sadie. She yelped, tried to fight back, but the creature was too fast, too strong. It snatched her up like a doll, a sickening crunch snapping the air, and Sadie went limp. I don't know what came over me. Fury, stupidity, who can say? But I raised the shotgun and fired. The shot hit it square in the chest. But it just... twitched. Turned those empty black eyes on me and snarled again, dropping Sadie's broken body. I fired again, and it stumbled backward, a ragged hole in its side. But it didn't go down. Instead, it turned and vanished into the trees with unnatural speed. I stood there, shaking. Didn't even reload the gun. What was the point? I knew right then, ain't nothing made of flesh and blood taking down a beast like that. Left Sadie where she lay. Didn't want to touch her. Didn't want to see her up close. Made my way back to the cabin, feeling its eyes on my back the whole way. Locked myself in, boarded up the windows. Didn't sleep a wink for a week straight. Heard it outside most nights, snarling and scratching at the walls. Sounded like it was trying to get in, trying to get to me. Then, just as sudden as it came, it was gone. Silence came back to the woods. I went out after a few days, 
shotgun in hand. There wasn't no sign of Sadie, or of that... thing. Found some deep gouges in the trees, and once... Once I thought I saw a bloody handprint on my shed, high up like whatever made it had just leapt straight onto the roof. Got out of there as quick as I could manage. Went and stayed with my sister in Springfield for a while. She kept saying it was probably a rabid coyote. I was overreacting. Maybe. But those eyes... I looked right into the devil's eyes that day. Folks called me crazy. Maybe I am. But I ain't been back to the woods since. Took up living in a trailer park. Can't stand being alone anymore. Hear noises in the night sometimes. Sometimes I swear I smell something rotten. Like death, clinging to my clothes. Figure it's all in my head. But sometimes... Sometimes I look out my grimy little window, see the tree line, and wonder if it's out there waiting. Sometimes I start thinking about poor Sadie and how she didn't deserve to die like that, and that old cold fury starts to burn in me all over again. A couple of years back, some backpackers went missing out in those woods. They never found the bodies, just some ripped up tents and a lot of blood. The newspapers blamed it on a bear attack. Me, I know better. The locals, well, they call it the skin taker sometimes. Some old legend, I guess. Whatever it is, I pray I never see it again. But I don't think that prayer will do me no good. Thing like that, once it sets its sights on you, you're marked till the day you die. My name is Alex Porter, and this happened to me on February 21st, 1997. It was my first solo field assignment with the CIA. Well, solo in the loosest of terms. Being new to the Classified Operations Division, I still wasn't sure exactly what kind of rabbit hole they were sending me down, only that it all sounded a little too outlandish, even for us. My mission was to investigate a series of bizarre disappearances in and around the Okefenokee Swamp. Sprawling across the border between southeastern Georgia and northern Florida, the Okefenokee is one of the largest intact freshwater wetlands in the U.S., a primeval wilderness where legends of strange beasts and lost civilizations have echoed for centuries. I'd always been a skeptic, a rational man in a world that sometimes defied all reason. Still, I couldn't deny the growing sense of uneasiness gnawing at me as I made my way down to Hickox, a tiny town on the swamp's edge. Hickox was the kind of place you miss if you blink driving down the highway. A general store, a gas station, a worn-out diner with faded Coca-Cola signs. The kind of place where locals eye out of towners with a mix of curiosity and suspicion. I sought out the local sheriff, Sheriff Hank Bell. A bear of a man, Sheriff Bell had a face etched with deep lines that spoke of long, hard days and maybe even longer nights. He greeted me with a drawl as slow and thick as molasses and a handshake that crushed my fingers. As expected, the sheriff was a man of few words. Ain't much to tell, Sheriff Bell said, leaning back in his creaky chair. Folks go missing. Hikers, the occasional hunter. Never turn up no trace, no scent. I asked him about the rumors about local legends whispered around campfires. He dismissed them out of hand, just tall tales from a bored town. Still, there was a glint in his eye, a hesitation I couldn't quite place. After leaving the station, I decided to walk around town. Locals watched me from their porches, their stairs lingering longer than what felt comfortable. I decided to try the diner, hoping to pick up some conversation. Maybe a scrap of local gossip that the sheriff wouldn't share. Inside, the diner buzzed with a low hum of chatter. I took a seat at the counter and ordered some truly horrible coffee and a slice of apple pie that was surprisingly good. Next to me sat an old man with faded tattoos and a weathered cowboy hat. He seemed to be nursing the same cup of coffee he'd had when I walked in. After a couple of glances my way, he spoke, his voice hoarse. You that fella asking about the vanishings? I'm looking into it, I replied, 
keeping my response intentionally vague. The old man stared into the dark depths of his mug, his face unreadable. Ever hear tell of the swamp blower? He had my attention. Can't say I have. Most ain't, he muttered. Old folk's story. Parents used to warn kids misbehaving, saying the swamp blower'd come get him in the night, snatched him up, never to be seen again. He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. Thing is, sometimes even grown folk disappear, folks would know these swamps better than their own backyard. He shrugged, his eyes clouded with something like fear. I thanked the old man, leaving my untouched coffee on the counter. Back at my motel that night I tried to write a report, to find logic in all this. The missing person cases were few, spread out over decades. Could it all be explained by accidents, animal attacks, or deliberate vanishings? Sleep was a restless affair filled with strange, vivid dreams, whispers of something moving in the shadows, a feeling of being watched by unseen eyes. It was hard to shake the image of the old man in the diner, the conviction in his voice. The next morning, I decided to get into the swamp myself, to see firsthand what I was dealing with. I rented an old battered John boat from a bait shop and set off alone, armed only with a map, a compass, and the old man's unsettling story in my head. The deeper I ventured into the Okafinoki, the more oppressive it felt. The air was still and humid, the dense tangle of cypress trees and lily pads closing in around me. The water was dark, reflecting the twisted branches like skeletal fingers reaching out from below. There was a primeval silence, broken only by the croaking of frogs and the relentless buzz of mosquitoes. Hours passed as I navigated the maze-like waterways. The sense I wasn't alone grew with each twist and turn of the boat. I swore I could hear rustling in the undergrowth, as if something just out of sight was paralleling my movements. Every rustle, every splash, sent a jolt of adrenaline through my system. Yet, each time I turned my head, I saw nothing but the endless tangle of vegetation. With the sun starting its slow descent, I decided to head back. Turning the John boat around a particularly dense cluster of cypress, I suddenly recoiled. There, not ten feet away, was a face. Not a human face, though. It was broad and flattened, eyes set wide apart and bulging. Its mouth stretched in a wide grimace, revealing rows of jagged teeth. The skin was a mottled green-brown, textured like rough bark. The stench hit me next, a foul mix of rotting vegetation and stagnant water. Before I could process what I was seeing, the creature lunged. I barely had time to raise my arm before its claws ripped across my chest, sending a jolt of pain through my body. The creature's weight slammed into the boat, its momentum nearly capsizing us. I stumbled, my gun slipping from my grasp as I fought to regain my footing. The creature hissed, a sound like rusted nails against wet glass, before diving beneath the murky surface. Scrabbling in the bottom of the boat, I managed to retrieve my weapon and shakily aimed it at the water, heart pounding like a war drum against my ribs. The creature didn't resurface. I sat there, gasping for breath, unable to tear my gaze from the spot where it had disappeared. My arm throbbed and blood seeped through my torn shirt. The sun dipped below the tree line, casting long, ominous shadows across the swamp. I knew I needed to get out of there, to get back and report. Report what? Whatever that creature was, it could not be explained away. It didn't fit the profile of any known animal, of any local legend. The swamp blower of the old man's tales made real? It was crazy, but a part of me clung to that ridiculous story as the only thing that made any sort of sense. Panic started to worm its way through my veins. I turned the boat, frantically working the small outboard motor, desperate to put as much distance between myself and that thing as I could. The air grew heavy, the sense of something watching me intensifying with each passing second. The ride back through the twilight was a blur of fear and adrenaline. 
Every snag in the water looked like the creature in my terror-fueled imagination. I had no idea if it was stalking me, waiting for the opportune moment to attack again. When I finally reached the dock, night had well and truly fallen, cloaking the swamp in impenetrable darkness. I stumbled back to my motel, clutching my injured arm and trying to rationalize what I'd seen. No matter how I twisted the events, there was no way I could write this off as an animal attack. I cleaned my wounds as best I could and wrapped them with a ragged towel, ignoring the throbbing pain. I needed to report this, needed to warn the locals. I reached for the phone, but as I lifted the receiver, a sound echoed through the room. A scraping sound, a dragging sound coming from under my bed. Frozen in terror, I slowly lowered the receiver. The noise stopped. I waited barely breathing, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. The scrape started again, closer this time, followed by a low, guttural growl that sent ice down my spine. My vision swam as a wave of dizziness washed over me. I was going to die here, in this run-down motel room at the edge of the swamp, torn to pieces by some nightmare creature straight out of folklore. I thought of the missing persons, of the sheriff's haunted look and the old man's whispered warnings in the diner. Then, a surge of anger cut through my fear. I wasn't going down without a fight. Grabbing the lamp from the bedside table, I slowly lowered myself to the floor, peering into the darkness. There it was. Its reptilian eyes glowed with a predatory gleam in the dim light filtering in from the bathroom. The creature's massive form was wedged halfway under the bed, and I watched in horrified fascination as it attempted to pull itself free. The muscles along its back rippled as it strained against the space, splintering the cheap wooden frame with a loud crack. I lunged forward, swinging the lamp with all my strength. It connected with the creature's head, sending it reeling back with a pained hiss. I swung again and again, driving it further back under the bed. There was a sudden tearing sound, followed by a shriek of pain that made my ears ring. Seizing the moment, I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the door. I yanked it open, slammed it behind me, and ran. Bursting through the motel office, I desperately yelled for the man behind the desk. At first, there was only confused silence, and then a muffled boom like a gunshot, followed by a chilling bellow that shook the walls. I barely took shelter behind the front desk before the creature burst through the door, shattering the flimsy structure. There was another crash, and a scream cut short. The creature roared again, a sound of fury and pain. I knew then it wouldn't pursue me, not right away. Crouched on the dirty carpet, I could hear the sounds of destruction, the creature's enraged movements muffled by the flimsy walls. Sheriff Bell arrived within the hour lights flashing and sirens wailing. When he and his men stormed in, weapons drawn, I heard more gunshots, followed by an eerie silence. Cautiously, they searched the wreckage of the room. When they finally emerged, the disbelief on their faces was almost comical. The body was gone. All that remained was a scattering of dark blood staining the carpet, an overturned bed, and a splintered doorway hanging off its hinges as a testament to the night's horrors. At the hospital, they stitched my wounds closed and gave me a hefty dose of painkillers. Sheriff Bell sat by my bed, staring off into the middle distance. He told me no one had believed him, that his reports about the missing persons, the strange circumstances, had been dismissed as the ramblings of a small-town lawman with an overactive imagination. I reckon I ain't the only one owes you an apology, he said softly. His face was weathered and tired, like something essential had been carved out of him. When I was released from the hospital, they handed me a file. It was my case report, heavily redacted. The cause of the incident was officially listed as an unknown animal attack. The disappearance of the motel clerk was classified as a separate missing persons case. I knew my report, when it reached Langley, would be relegated to some forgotten archive, joining countless other unexplained encounters. 
I left Hickox the very same day, driving until the Okafinoki was nothing but a speck in my rearview mirror. In the years that followed, I took on different missions, saw my share of darkness in far-flung corners of the world, but the incident in the swamp lingered, a shadow I could never fully outrun. There would always be nights where I woke in a cold sweat, the reek of stagnant water heavy in the air, the piercing yellow eyes of the creature fresh in my mind. Sometimes I'd see news reports out of Georgia, unexplained disappearances on the edge of a vast wilderness, cases forever unsolved. I knew without a doubt that it was continuing its gruesome work in the depths of the Okafinoki. The aftermath is a quiet sort of haunting. I moved on with my life, got married, had a daughter, but a piece of me remains trapped back in that mosquito-infested swamp. I told myself in the beginning that the creature was an anomaly, some evolutionary aberration or undiscovered species. Over time, I've come to the chilling realization that might not be the whole truth. There were rumors in the agency, whispers about things lurking in remote corners of the earth, and sometimes late at night when my daughter is fast asleep. I wonder how many more creatures like the Swamp Blower exist, hidden in the darkness, and how long it will be before they come out of the shadows. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous, the type of tale you brush off with a nervous laugh in company. Of course, at the time, it was far from laughable. I'm a numbers guy, an engineer. Skepticism comes with the territory. Yet even now, there are questions I can't answer. Parts that just don't make sense. My buddy Corin has always been the outdoorsy type. Fishing, hunting, you name it. He convinced me to take a summer weekend and go RV camping. Just us two guys, some beers, and maybe a fish or two if we were lucky. Turns out he had a spot in mind. The Red Creek Reserve in Utah. Beautiful place. Remote. Not another soul in sight the way Corin liked it. Red Creek is known for its red soil, a deep canyon running through it, and its old mines from the Gold Rush era. There's one big abandoned one that's supposed to be dangerous. Locals have their stories about that, of course. The first day was perfect. As perfect as you can ask for with only a tent and an RV parked at the canyon's rim. But somewhere on day two, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was only a flash, the sun glinting off something down below. Then again, there was something moving further down in the canyon, just on the edge of the tree line. Corin, you seeing this? I pointed, but he squinted with a shrug. Probably just a deer or something. His lack of concern emboldened me. Camera in hand, I decided to scramble down a short stretch of the slope for a better look. It wasn't wildlife. That much was clear. Too far off to really say for sure, but the figure looked large. Humanoid. I scrambled back to the RV, feeling foolish for venturing down there alone. We joked about Bigfoot, about how ridiculous it all was. Yet something niggled at my rational mind. It wasn't a bear. The shape wasn't right. I had the strange feeling I was being watched. That night was... odd. It wasn't exactly fear that kept me tossing and turning. It was that unsettling feeling, a low, prickly awareness that everything might not be as it seemed. I'd woken up once with the distinct sense I'd heard something shuffling just outside the RV. It was quiet enough out there that I should have heard an animal, but there was nothing. I convinced myself it was nerves getting the better of me. Day three is when everything shifted into the realm of nightmare. My name's Ellis, by the way. Ellis Pratt. It started, innocently enough, with Corin going on a morning fish down by the creek. Nothing much was biting, so he figured he'd try a spot further upstream. Told me he'd be back before lunch. That was the last time I saw him. At first I wasn't concerned. Then the hours started dragging by. Lunch came and went. By mid-afternoon, 
I didn't know what to think. Maybe an accident? He'd told me the upstream path got rocky. A tumble? Then lost in the trees? It sounded plausible. Until I came across the snapped fishing rod beside the creek. Its end was splintered. The line cut jaggedly. It didn't look like someone breaking it in a fall. It was then I finally felt it. Cold, crawling fear. That's when I got the hell out of there. Left my stuff in the RV, just sprinted back up the path. There was only one narrow road in and out of the reserve. There had to be other people at the trailhead. It was almost dark before I got there, chest heaving, heart pounding. I saw no one. My first panicked instinct was to keep running. Just get as far away from the place as possible. My rational brain wouldn't allow it. What about Corin? I sat in my car, staring into the darkening trees, every instinct screaming. That's when the police siren split the night. Turns out someone reported an abandoned RV matching mine. Routine check, they said. They took me back to the reserve, shown their flashlights around, asked questions. When daylight rolled around, a full-scale search party combed the whole area. Nothing. No Corin. No sign of struggle. No trace of another living thing. Nothing about his vanishing made sense. It was like he had disappeared into thin air. Then, maybe two weeks later, came the package. I came home to find it sitting on my porch, unmarked, no return address. Inside the package was Corin's battered camera, an SD card tucked next to the battery hatch. That night, hands shaking, I plugged it into my laptop. I wish I hadn't. There were photos and videos, all from my friends last morning by the creek. Normal stuff at first, him adjusting his line, casting, some shots of the trees, then the change. It started with blurred images, as if the camera was bumped or jerked. Then it stabilized. Corin was running. No, not just running. Fleeing in terror. Then the lens caught it for a split second. A man. I say man, but there was something not quite right. Tall, freakishly so, like Corin was a toy compared to him. Pale skin, almost gray. Hair, a dark, matted tangle. The rest of the video was just the camera tumbling on the ground, pointing up at the sky. Audio continued, though. My friend's screams, horrible crunching sounds, then another sound, this low, rasping laugh like nothing I've ever heard, human or otherwise. And then, abruptly, it cut out. Police took the camera. They checked. No signs of tampering. I described the man I saw, hesitantly. Of course, the officer gave me that half-pitying, half-concerned look. He thought I was losing it. Who can blame him? For months, it consumed me. Every shadow looked like him. Every creaking floorboard was his approaching step. Corin was never found. They eventually declared him legally dead. The official explanation? Animal attack. The thing is, there were two more cases in Red Creek since then. People vanishing without a trace. Always around that abandoned mine, it turns out. Locals talk now. It wasn't just stories from back in the day. That mine... Something lives there. Whatever was out there snatched my friend, took the others. I couldn't tell them all I saw, not back then. People don't like to believe in impossible things. But you'll listen, right? Sometimes, late at night, I take out the camera and watch just the first moments of that video. That first glimpse of something inhuman lurking in the trees. Some twisted part of me replays those sounds trying to decipher another word behind the laughter. To me, it wasn't the sounds Corin made that were most haunting. It was the thing that ended them. There was amusement in that inhuman rasp, the amusement of a game well played. Maybe that's what it is to him, out there in the deep, dark woods. Just a game. This year, I might go back to Red Creek, alone. People will think I'm crazy. They'll try to stop me. I have to, though, to see if maybe, just maybe, 
there's more to find. Something on that video I missed. Or maybe not even on the video. I keep thinking back to that flash of movement the day before. The light glinting off something at the tree line. The last thing I want is proof. Some bone to give them. Evidence they can dismiss or deny. They won't get any of that from me. Corin didn't get a body to take home. All I want is some small thing to explain why it happened. An answer. I know. Logically, it won't change anything. He's gone. But this... This gnawing uncertainty, this fear that, somehow, he could have made it out there, could be alive and in need of help, if I find nothing. A clean ending to this twisted tale. That's what will finally finish me. Because if all these disappearances in the same small place are merely random acts of nature, then well, it seems the world is far darker and scarier than even a crazy tale of a lurking inhuman thing. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now, here's the thing about me, Thad, by the way. I'm one of those preparedness guys. Self-sufficiency, living off the land, not full-on doomsday cult, but hey, a little planning never hurt anyone. That's how I found myself out in the wilderness, far-flung corner of the Olympic National Forest, testing my skills with a minimalist camping setup. I figured what better proving ground than those ancient mountains and rugged landscapes, right? It started well enough. First night, I managed to snag a couple of trout from a stream and made a passable fire without too much trouble. Sure, there were some sounds at night, branches breaking, the distant call of some animal I didn't recognize, but hey, you expect that in the woods. The real trouble began on the second day. That's when I stumbled onto the signs of another camp. Not an official site with marked trails, but deeper in. There was evidence of someone. An old campfire. Half-hidden shelters built from deadfall. And a lot of stripped bones littering the ground. They seemed old. No scavengers had messed with them. My survivalist brain switched into high gear. The setup didn't seem temporary. Something had been living there for a hell of a long time. This wasn't just another camper. A wave of unease swept over me. There's the wilderness you expect, and the kind that feels... wrong. Back at my own meager camp, I tried to convince myself that perhaps it was a poacher hideout, or something equally explainable. But with every rustling wind in the trees, every snap of a twig echoing eerily through the valley, that gut feeling intensified. I'd stumbled onto someone's territory... By morning, any attempt at rationalization had fizzled away. All my senses were in overdrive, that instinctive part of my brain kicking in and shouting that someone, or something, was watching me from the dark edges of the trees. When I saw a crude spear jammed into the earth near my meager campfire, it was a breaking point. No note, no threat, just a clear mark that I'd been discovered. With trembling hands, I packed up what little gear I had, a knot of dread growing in my stomach. As I hiked out, there was this persistent prickling sensation at the back of my neck. Not once did I ever see him, though that didn't mean he wasn't there. It would have been easier to write myself off as crazy, overreacting to some strange hiker or recluse messing with me. But that gnawing terror was like nothing I'd ever felt. Then, as I approached a road, I saw it. The body of an animal mangled and barely recognizable, and not by any predator I knew. Then, the smell of it, acrid and coppery, the stink of iron clinging to the air. That's when I knew the stories whispered of that area might not be mere local lore after all. The locals mentioned disappearances, the odd hunter or hiker simply vanishing. That feeling in the deepest shadows of those forests didn't feel human. The rational side of me wants to think that maybe, just maybe, these disappearances were the acts of a disturbed individual pushed too far living in isolation. But I was there. I felt that presence, that unnatural weight hanging in the air. No human is made for that type of wilderness. 
a park ranger I encountered looked startled by my disheveled, sweaty appearance as I emerged from the tree line. When I asked about recent disappearances, a strange look flashed across his weathered face for a heartbeat. Before he told me it was nothing to worry about, son, that these woods had always been unforgiving. Later, after a shower and a night in a cheap motel, I tried to search for news reports, anything that matched what I'd seen. Not a trace. I considered returning, perhaps with a camera, or better yet, some company. The smarter man in me knows better. There are some secrets we aren't meant to unlock. A month after the ordeal, I still couldn't completely shake that sensation I'd been stalked. Was it a hermit who resented my intrusion? Did some twisted individual take pleasure in preying on unsuspecting victims? Or was I foolish enough to venture into that isolated land just as some folks from an earlier time claimed? Land where old, hungry things waited, their only company the bones of their unwitting sacrifices. It doesn't take monsters with claws and fangs for pure terror to take hold. The worst predators in this world wear plain clothes, or perhaps no clothes at all. It was during the month of August back in 2018 that I learned the depths of terror the human psyche can endure. My name is Leon Bowers, a senior technician for a small broadband company servicing rural areas across the United States. We had gotten a call from an old cabin that needed internet connectivity over off of Route 9 in Maine. Unbeknownst to me, that call would change my life forever. I arrived at the assigned location around dusk, and it struck me as odd because there wasn't another house for miles around. Only vast forests and raw wilderness stretched out before me. Dismissing my unease as mere fatigue after a long day at work, I quickly set up the equipment and decided to do a quick check inside the cottage. This is where my life took an unexpected, horrible turn. Greeting me inside was a bizarre scene blood-covered walls, furniture smashed to splinters, and glass shards scattered everywhere. Overcoming my initial shock, I carefully stepped past the gore and destruction, my eyes searching for any sign of what could have caused this devastation. But what sent chills down my spine was an eerie mural on one wall made with blood, depicting several children with pitch-black eyes. My mind raced as I tried to piece together this puzzle. Was it some sick prank or an artist's twisted imagination gone too far? And yet I stood there tied to those haunting images, even as my instincts screamed at me to get out of there fast. Suddenly, something moved in the dark recesses of the wreckage. With cautious steps, I approached the source of the movement, only for it to disappear deeper into shadow. Panic fueled my heart as I followed the shifting form through room after room, Eventually I saw them, five small children standing in a circle in the moonlit room beyond. Their obsidian eyes were like bottomless pits devoid of any warmth or humanity. In seeing these black-eyed children up close, an unbearable feeling of dread gripped me, and I knew I had to leave immediately. As I turned to escape, one of the children smiled menacingly and began to step towards me, Suddenly, my mind was filled with horrifying thoughts that twisted my body with pain. I felt their vile intentions seeping into my very being. Petrified, I realized there was no way to call for help. Why hadn't I told anyone where I'd be working? My phone was back in the truck where it would do me no good, and the landline wasn't operational yet. The fear intensified as they advanced slowly and deliberately closing in on me. A dim thought bled through the torture. Could they read my mind? Did they know how futile my situation had become? Overwhelmed by panic, I lunged past them towards the front door. One child reached out to grab me as I sprinted by them, and their cold fingers latched onto my wrist like a vice grip. Ripping my arm away from their grasp, flesh tore from bone in a spray of blood. Even though it hurt like hell, my survival instinct kicked in, 
I burst through the door into the sanctuary of the moonlit night beyond, just as one of those wretched creatures let out a screech rivaling any banshee's wail. Tears streamed down my face as the shrill cry penetrated right into my marrow. Frantically darting towards my truck, those demons haunted every beat of my heart until finally passing doorknob that gave way to their evil beyond my reach. Hysterical called for help. Night gave sight safety truck gasping tumult, invisible beyond outside. I didn't have much time to think, as I tried to make sense of what was going on. Those black-eyed children were hell-bent on catching me, and I had no idea why. With my forearms seeping blood and my head pounding from their assault on my mind, I reached my truck. I fumbled with the keys before finally managing to start the engine. The vehicle roared to life just in time for me to slam on the gas pedal and speed away from that nightmarish scene, leaving a trail of blood and terror behind me. While driving, I desperately tried to call for help. But with no reception in this godforsaken area, I was painfully aware that I wouldn't get any assistance anytime soon. Fearful for my life and wishing I'd warned someone about my plans, I yelled in frustration at the realization that nobody knew where I was. My thoughts raced as panic continued to fuel me forward. What were those black-eyed children capable of? Who or what were they? Questions flooded me while my survival instinct urged me not to look back. It wasn't long before a small town loomed at the edge of the horizon. My heart leaped with hope. As soon as I entered the town, I stopped at the local sheriff's department, stumbling into the lobby with wild eyes and a bloody arm. The officers stared at me in shock before one snapped into action and guided me towards a chair. They began asking questions about what happened, but I couldn't form a coherent response. All that mattered right then was getting help. An ambulance arrived quickly, covering my injured arm with a makeshift bandage as they loaded me up and rushed towards the hospital. One EMT inside held it up gently while the driver navigated carefully through town searching for stability as he listened intently to our conversation. In my newfound safety, thoughts started coming together somewhat more coherently. Something attacked me while working alone at the construction site. These strange, black-eyed children nobody knew about in the demilitarized zone between fear and reality. As the hospital loomed into view, I mentally prepared to explain my encounter to a doctor who would no doubt find my claims incredulous. For all I knew, they might think it was an elaborate hoax or maybe even a drug-induced hallucination. Still, I was a survivor, injured and bleeding, but alive despite terrifying odds. The black-eyed children chased me to the very edge of sanity that night, making me question what sinister forces lay hidden in those depths of darkness. There's always a fleeting moment, right before your alarm blares for the day, where life is nothing but a serene dream. That sliver of peace was shattered the minute I set foot into the dense woods surrounding the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island, where I work. As a geneticist for the secretive government-funded initiative codenamed Project Lycan, my job was to tinker with genes most dared not touch. Among my colleagues was Zephyr Kreutzer, an odd man with a knack for virology, and Echo Yarwood, whose work on gene splicing had won a multitude of clandestine accolades. Communication in our facilities was always brisk, professional, and sprinkled with dark humor. If our test subjects ever got Tinder profiles, Echo mused, they'd swipe right and you'd wake up as a bat. Things shifted one serene evening when Zephyr failed to report to his station. As protocol dictated, I went looking for him. The lab was secure, but it's what lay outside that unsettled me. The sprawling woodlands seemed to envelop the silhouettes of night in a curtain of darkness. Logic dictated he wouldn't wander there without reason. It wasn't until I found his lab coat near an unauthorized access hatch that led to the forest perimeter did that gut-punch feeling hit, a silent alarm we all have for when things don't align with our understanding of the world. 
Armed with nothing but my keycard and an unsteady breath, I ventured outside. My flashlight cut swaths through the nocturnal symphony of rustling leaves and distant animal calls. The quietude felt oppressive, more so when I stumbled upon streams of blood leading towards an unknown destination within the woods. Now here's a simple joke. How do you track a bleeding scientist in pitch dark? You listen for the curses about his ruined white coat, or you find something far worse wearing it. To call what I saw wildlife would be sardonic even by my standards. It was as if childhood nightmares were born from local lore about beasts lurking in deep woods and given flesh, an unholy amalgamation of man and beast coated in carmine satire. My skepticism wrestled with raw terror when its gaze locked onto me. Every rational particle of my being wanted to call it a bear, a distorted mirage, but I knew bears didn't move with such deliberate malice or have eyes that flickered with human intelligence. In a moment all too vivid yet surreal, it charged, and instinct took over. My firearm, an indulgence equally shunned in scientific circles as it was necessary given our work, came to life in my hands like an omen I'd yet to understand. Echo's words from days past taunted me now. Our creations can always tell their maker. Was this creature chasing me, another result of science marched grimly forward without ethics? Clarity was scarce, as its growls choreographed a horrifying dance amongst twisted trees while bullets matched its steps. More than once it swiped at me, a warning each time. It wanted not just my life, but whatever semblance of reality I clung to. My escape became primal maneuvering, ducking under clawed arms covering ground etched in deathly intent. Between desperate calls broadcast on our secure comms begging for backup and gasping pleas for survival lay an uncomfortable truth. Help wasn't coming because they couldn't hear or refuse to believe. The chase broke into a cleaving silence only dread could whisper over. History was replete with creatures part myth, part revelation. In this shadow-drenched chase through labyrinthine wilderness lay cold implications beneath every momentary reprieve from violent pursuit. A glimpse at my watch revealed hours had passed, or maybe just seconds. Time distorted when chased by fables wrought real, a mockery of humanity's reign over nature. Lungs burning fiercely against cool night air could not douse the heat within, as unanswered questions propelled my flight deeper within brush and bramble an elusive safety, seemingly always one step ahead. Each labored breath drew sharp contrasts between cultivated control within laboratory walls and wildness personified hunting doggedly at my heels. The potential end weighing heavily like Zephyr's abandoned white coat, heavy with crimson expressionism mocking in gruesome artistry. I pressed on, the thorns lashing my face and arms with each desperate step. I clutched my side where the creature had caught me, warm wetness telling tales of a wound deeper than I dared to inspect. It would have to wait. Ahead, moonlight seemed to reach for me through the dark canopy, promising thinner forest and possibly a road. I should have called for help when I first heard that dreadful sound behind me. But in the fog of panic and disbelief, the concept of reaching out slipped away like sand through fingers. The radios we carried became decorative at best, the static humming a useless lullaby against this living nightmare's roar. The sound came again, a guttural snarl that seized my attention, willpower the only shield against its chilling effects. I glanced back. Two eyes gleamed like coals at dusk. Its shape was hulking. A dark silhouette, mercifully not yet fully defined by my terror-stricken gaze. Its forelimbs were disproportioned in length, built for reaching rather than running, and ended in claws that tore up earth with each unchecked swipe. Skin glistened as though coated in some filmy mucus, catching errant rays that filtered through the trees. Another growl, close enough to feel vibrations underfoot. This wasn't the time for thought or heroics. This was raw instinct about survival. I broke into a clearing and glimpsed roofs, 
a welcome sign of civilization, maybe safety. Lights painted feeble hopes across my mind's canvas as I stumbled toward the possibility of refuge. The chase continued down narrow alleys, me always just ahead of malevolent intent, manifesting in destructive pursuit. Houses lined my path but stood lifeless. Had they heard and barricaded themselves against this horror? Or was it just too late? Near collapse from exertion and blood loss, I reached a town square where lights shone brightest, perhaps hope personified in these darkest of moments. The creature lunged one last time, but collided with something unforeseen. A car had swerved into its path. Metal clashed with flesh, an ugly symphony heralding momentary reprieve as the creature reeled from impact against something more tangible than fear or flight. People emerged then. Voices rose to assemble reality from nightmare shards. Bystanders turned rescuers moved toward me, while others faced down the now grounded terror with tools turned weapons. Wade! Over here! called out a familiar voice. A colleague missing from our expedition team returned from seeking help upon realizing we were overdue. Emergency services swarmed soon after, crawling over one another to attend to wounds or quell lingering alarms stirred by surreal events. In hospital linen later, Authorities questioned me between gentle prods at memory's tender spots, trying to paint veracity on an unbelievable canvas, a creature they could not classify terrorizing their quiet existence. They never found it despite searches that went on for days after. Only evidence remained, the torn metal carcass of a car and copious trails of dark ichor leading back to whatever abyss birthed it into our world. We gathered once more as a team some days later. Even those injured insisted on attending this strange wake of sorts, for normalcy turned fiction by force unheard till now. Speculations spun wild as tired minds tried reason, but ultimately found none. This beast wore no label science could claim, nor lay trodden paths folklore might whisper tales about. Just cold fact in form, indescribable now forever etched into each survivor's tale, recounting abject horror faced and somehow overcome despite logic's protest display. July 11th, 2016. Figured getting away from the rat race and living off the land would be my salvation ex-cop, seen too many dark sides of humanity, got myself a plot in the remote Ozark Mountains, built a cabin, learned the ways of the woods. Everyone called me Miller, never asked too many questions about my past. Summer went fine, hiked the hills, spent evenings on the porch watching the sunset, felt that peace I'd been craving start to seep back into me. Things changed come fall. First, it was the cattle on neighboring ranches going missing. Ripped apart, half-eaten, not like any predator I recognized. Then old Elias, a hermit who lived deeper in the hills, vanished. Folks started whispering about wild hog attacks, even panthers getting desperate with winter approaching. But I knew better. Had enough experience with crime scenes in my past life to recognize something else at work, something wrong. One crisp November morning, I found it. Tracks by the creek bigger than any man's, with claws that looked longer than my damn fingers. That's when the nightmares started. Not just dreams, but waking visions. A flash of teeth, a hulking shape moving at unnatural speed through the trees, the feeling of being watched. I started sleeping with a loaded shotgun by my bed, feeling crazy and paranoid, but knowing deep down I wasn't imagining things. Then came the night I finally saw it, woke to branches snapping outside, the hair prickling on the back of my neck. The moon was bright, casting long shadows, and that's when I saw it hunched by the tree line. Too tall to be a bear, even standing on its hind legs, covered in ragged fur, with a face like a starved dog stretched long and twisted. But the eyes, those damn yellow eyes burned with a hungry light that could chill your soul. We locked eyes for a long, horrifying moment. 
Then, it lunged. Before I could grab the shotgun, it smashed through my window, glass flying everywhere. I scrambled backwards, fumbling for the gun, but it was on me, knocking me to the ground. Its claws raked across my chest, tearing my shirt, leaving burning gashes on my skin. The smell hit me then, like rotting meat and something sulfurous underneath. Not animal, not human. I shoved it back with a desperate surge of adrenaline, rolled away, and managed to fire the shotgun. Buckshot tore into the thing's shoulder, and it let out a howl that split the night, a sound both animal and horribly, brokenly human. It staggered back, then vanished into the trees, leaving a trail of dark blood. I patched myself up as best I could, then waited with shaking hands for dawn. By first light, I had my gear packed, never even looked back at the cabin as I drove away, figured that thing would track me eventually, and I wasn't sticking around to find out when. Got a construction job in the city, hate the noise, the crowds, but I sleep on a ratty mattress on a grimy floor with a bolted door between me and the world. Every time I see a shadow move too fast out of the corner of my eye, my heart thuds. Every time I smell something rotten, that putrid stench from the woods comes flooding back. Some nights, I think I hear a scratching at the window, and a ragged, howling cry that pierces through the traffic noise. Nobody believes me when I try to tell them what's out there. Maybe it's better that way. They say ignorance is bliss but some kinds of knowing scar you deeper than any wound. Folks up here have stories of Ozark howlers, things that stalk the dark hollers and prey on the lost and the weak. I don't know what that thing was. Don't even want to think about it too much. All I know is I survived, and some aren't so lucky. My name is Lucas Kane, and this happened to me on July 23, 2008. I'm an agent with the CIA, one of those guys who gets sent in when things get so weird even the regular agents wash their hands of it. Monsters like the one I encountered in the Everglades. Let's just say they don't make it into official briefings. The Everglades are a primordial place, a vast expanse of water, mangroves and sun-bleached sawgrass stretching to the horizon. Alligators slide beneath the murky water, exotic birds shriek overhead, and the air thrums with the buzz of a billion insects. A place designed to remind you just how small and insignificant humans are in the grand scheme of things. Officially, I was sent to investigate suspected eco-terrorism. Poachers, smugglers, the usual swamp rats causing trouble. The reality? Well, that was far more disturbing. Locals were whispering about mutilated livestock, mangled beyond any known predator attack. And then there were the disappearances, hunters and hikers vanishing without a trace in the tangled waterways. Those vanishing sent a shiver down my spine, a prickle of unease the years of training couldn't fully suppress. I teamed up with a park ranger named Anya, a tough, sun-weathered woman with a no-nonsense attitude and a haunted look in her eyes. She'd grown up in the swamps, knew the territory like the back of her hand. Anya didn't believe in old wives' tales, but there was an edge to her voice when she relayed the chilling stories passed down by generations of her people. We spent most of a week combing through the swamp, finding nothing except oppressive heat and clouds of mosquitoes. Locals cast us wary glances, reluctant to break their code of silence about what lurked in the depths. Just when I was ready to chalk it up as another overblown conspiracy theory, we got our first solid lead. A hysterical family stumbled out of the mangroves, babbling about their fishing trip turned nightmare. Their boat was half-sunken, shredded as if clawed by some massive animal. More disturbing was their description of the creature they swore had attacked them, a hulking, amphibious beast with glowing eyes. After calming them down, Anya and I went to investigate. The boat was a wreck, just as they'd described. 
but it was the smell that hit me first. A rank, swampy odor overlaid with something sharp and metallic. Blood. Lots of it, staining the splintered wood. Whatever had attacked the boaters, it hadn't been an alligator. We set up camp at the edge of the sawgrass, Anya and I falling into a tense silence broken only by the croaking of frogs and the rustle of creatures unseen in the darkness. The feeling of being watched prickled the back of my neck. I knew instinctively that we were no longer the hunters, but the hunted. Nightfall transformed the swamp. Each rustle and splash seemed amplified, every shadow a potentially deadly threat. Then, just as the last light was draining from the sky, we heard it. A low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. Anya and I exchanged a grim look. The hunt was on. We moved cautiously, flashlights cutting arcs through the gloom. The creature was stalking us, intelligent and patient. I caught glimpses of its movement in the underbrush, flashes of yellow eyes reflecting back the pale moonlight. Suddenly, it lunged from the mangroves, a monstrous eruption of scales and claws. Its size was staggering, easily twice the height of a man, and built like a tank. Its skin was leathery, mottled with shades of green and brown, camouflaging it perfectly in its environment. A massive, elongated snout ended in rows of razor-sharp teeth. Anya fired first, her rifle barking in the stillness. The creature seemed more annoyed than hurt, letting out a deafening roar that vibrated through the swamp. That roar was my first mistake. It drew attention. They came from the water, a whole pack of them. Sleek bodies slithered through the murky depths, glowing eyes fixed on us with predatory hunger. We were surrounded. Run! I shouted at Anya, knowing even as I said it that it was futile. The creatures hit us like a wave, claws tearing and teeth gnashing. Anya screamed, her gun clattering to the muddy ground. I fought back desperately, firing wildly into the thrashing bodies. One of the creatures latched onto my leg, its jaws crushing down on my calf. I screamed, the pain blinding, and kicked out frantically. Somehow, I managed to scramble back, dragging my injured leg, leaving a trail of blood in my wake. Behind me, I heard the sounds of Anya's struggle cut short with a sickening gurgle. There was no time for grief, only survival. I stumbled through the swamp, every instinct screaming at me to get out, to escape. The creatures pursued, the sounds of their splashing growing closer. I could smell their fetid breath, hear their clicking claws on the roots and decaying vegetation. Any hope that I might outrun them was fading. I tripped, my bad leg giving out, and tumbled into the water. The shock of its surprising coldness momentarily cleared some of the pain-induced fog from my brain. Ahead, I saw the twisted, half-submerged roots of a massive mangrove. Desperate, I lunged for it, hauling myself into the tangle of branches. I clung to the mangrove roots, my breaths harsh and ragged in the swampy air. The creatures circled below, the water roiling with their movement. Their yellow eyes glinted up at me, burning with malevolent intelligence. They didn't seem inclined to follow me into the tangle of roots. Perhaps their size worked against them here. A small sliver of hope flickered in the crushing despair. My injured leg throbbed with agonizing intensity. I ripped a strip from my shirt and fashioned a crude tourniquet gritting my teeth against waves of white-hot pain. If I didn't get out of here soon, infection or blood loss would finish what those monsters had started. The creatures, perhaps sensing my weakening state, grew bolder. One lunged forward, snapping its jaws just short of my dangling feet. Another attempted to scale the massive roots, only to slip back with an angry hiss. With a jolt of dread, I realized the water level was slowly rising high tide. Soon my precarious refuge would be well within reach of those razor-sharp claws. Panic flared inside me, hot and blinding. I had to move, but where? The mangrove stood alone, an island amidst a vast expanse of water and sawgrass. 
despair wrapped icy fingers around my heart. Then, through the haze of pain, I saw it. A flicker of light in the distance. Not the eerie glow of the creature's eyes, but a steady beam. A boat. Hope surged, hot and desperate. I cupped my hands around my mouth and shouted, my voice hoarse and weak against the vast emptiness of the swamp. The boat didn't change course. Either they hadn't heard or didn't care about some random yelling madman in the middle of nowhere. I shouted again, adding a desperate wave of my good arm. Still no response. Just as despair threatened to consume me again, the boat shifted course, turning slowly in my direction. Salvation. It took an agonizingly long time for the small airboat to reach me. Each minute felt like an hour, the creatures below growing more restless with every inch the water rose. I thought I heard gunfire, distant and muffled, followed by the fading echoes of those monstrous roars. Perhaps someone else was out there, buying me precious time. When the airboat finally drew close, two figures leaned over the edge. Hang tight! A burly, bearded man yelled. We saw the whole thing, damn swamp monsters! Relief washed over me so strong it nearly buckled my knees. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't alone. With their help, I managed to clamber aboard, collapsing in an exhausted heap. As the airboat sped away, I saw the mangrove sink below the waterline, the predators swarming over the last of my sanctuary. The aftermath was a blur. There were paramedics, a dingy field hospital, a whirlwind of official questions that I couldn't fully answer. They found Anya's remains, or what little the creatures had left of her. I never learned what happened to the boaters who helped rescue me. The official report chalked the whole thing up to a freak alligator attack, with my trauma-filled ramblings about a pack of monsters dismissed as hallucinations. I was medically discharged from the CIA, the gnawing ache in my leg is a constant reminder of that night, and my mangled calf might as well be branded with the truth the government will never acknowledge. Most nights, I lie awake, the guttural roars of the creatures and Anya's dying screams echoing in my ears. Sleep offers no respite, only vivid nightmares of clawed hands dragging me back down into the murky depths. I moved into a high-rise apartment in the heart of a bustling city, steel and concrete, and as far from the natural world as I could get. I cover the windows with blackout blinds, never quite able to banish the feeling of those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. Someone else at the agency took over my old case files, the ones that detail encounters too bizarre, too horrifying for the official records. Sometimes I wonder if they found other victims, other survivors like me. Most times I push the thought away, it's safer not to know. The creatures of the Everglades still prowl their watery domain, unseen and unacknowledged by the wider world. And I... I survive. I exist. Some might even call it living. But I know the truth. The monsters are real. And one fateful, blood-soaked night, they left their mark on me, body and soul. Sometimes late at night when the city seems to fall silent, I swear I can hear the distant rustling of the sawgrass and the soft splash of scaled bodies in the water. And I know it's only a matter of time until the swamp creatures come calling again. This happened to me a couple of years back. Still makes me look over my shoulder when I'm out and about, even in broad daylight. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy hiking as much as the next guy. Grew up in the suburbs, and you develop a love-hate relationship with the great outdoors. It calls to you, this feeling of escaping the daily grind. But there's also the nagging thought that sometimes, nature ain't so welcoming. My buddy Cade talked me into this specific trip. He's from Colorado, knows his way around a rock and a ridge. I'm Joel, by the way city boy and self-proclaimed reluctant adventurer. We picked a place out there in Nevada, something called Basin and Range National Monument. Sounds scenic enough, right? Turns out it's known for being isolated, like 
way, way out of range. That should have been my first warning sign. First night, everything's chill. Cade sets up the RV while I make an attempt at getting a decent campfire going. Turns out, surviving in the wild isn't my strong suit. It's just the two of us, miles from civilization, and I wouldn't mind admitting that this gives me the jitters. But we laugh it off. Beer helps settle my nerves. Things, you know, things, started going wrong that second day. We set out on a planned route. Nothing too major, but enough to test my novice legs. It was mid-afternoon, a relentless sun hanging overhead. Suddenly, Cade pulls up short. In the middle of the trail, there's this shape. Looks like fabric soaked in, well, the unmistakable dark rust color of dried blood. Right beside it, half hidden in the dust, we spot a bone. I don't need a biology degree to tell it's not some deer that wandered off course. No, sir. This leg bone is way too thick, the joint massive. We back up slowly, trying to keep our cool. We don't talk much, just get back to the RV in double time. We decide to make it a short trip, get the heck out of there. But back at the camp spot, it gets worse. My tires, all four of them, have been slashed clean through. Panics a fist tightening in my chest. Cade checks his cell service. The little bars aren't there anymore. That's when we start hearing the noises. Not quite animal, not quite human. More of a rustling, punctuated by guttural grunts. I tell Cade I think it's coyotes, but even I don't buy it. They don't sound... right. I grip a heavy flashlight, trying to feel less useless. There's no way Cade and I are sleeping out there that night. He packs us some supplies and we set off. Aim is to walk down the road until we're hopefully within cell range. But that leg bone we spotted keeps flashing in my mind. Whatever got that animal isn't something I want to stumble onto in the dark, surrounded by these rock formations reaching up like crooked fingers. We walk as quietly as possible. No conversation, just listening intently for more of those eerie grunts. Hours and miles later, we hit a stroke of luck. There's a flickering of signal on Cade's phone. My adrenaline surges with hopeful relief, thinking he can finally call for help. But that fades almost immediately with the realization, we're still so remote there's barely one bar. Cade manages to dial. Something might have broken through. An automated message. Just the generic county emergency line. That's it. Signal flickers back out. Now what? This feels hopeless. But I have to admit, it feels better than sitting and waiting in that RV for another round, with whatever made those horrifying noises. Dawn's our savior. Just enough light peeks through to see where we're going without stumbling into a cactus. Nevada deserts have plenty of those. Suddenly, Cade shouts a warning and my foot instinctively halts inches from movement. I look down and freeze. There, right across the trail, fresh paw prints in the dirt. Big ones. Easily double the size of a mountain lion. They're deep, and there's something off about the claws. Cade kneels down for a closer look, then looks up at me. We know this isn't natural, not some normal creature walking this land. Whatever left those prints... There's a feeling we shouldn't get in its way. The RV seems far, far behind us. But suddenly, that metal box holds an odd sense of safety compared to the vast landscape in front of us. The grunting started again. Sounds closer now. Not gonna lie. Fear gnaws at me like a rat. We break into a jog, ignoring the burning in our lungs. Cade glances back every once in a while. Not sure if I could handle what he might spot and we keep running, the grunts echoing ever closer, the landscape our prison. My mind races, a hundred useless escape plans flashing and dying in my head. And somehow, the RV stands defiant as we scramble back across the dusty terrain. Cade shoves me inside, locking the door just as the sound of footsteps hits the ground outside. 
We huddle together, eyes widening as the first thud strikes against the side of the vehicle. Each successive one makes it shudder. I have this crazy image of it tipping over completely, sending us rolling with our predator. In the sliver of a moon filtering through the window I see it. Just a glimpse because I ain't looking again. I can't take another look. It was enough to tell me that whatever it is, those grunts aren't animals. The way it moved wasn't right either. Two legs, yes, but hunched in an unnatural way. The shoulders wider than its squat torso, head low to the ground like it could scent us like prey. My stomach churns and bile threatens to rise up. The thuds against the RV continue, punctuated by that sound that has followed us, those awful, half-familiar grunts that are nothing short of chilling. That's the truth that hits hardest, that whatever creature made them almost sound sort of human, but twisted, wrong, maybe even mocking us, savoring our fear. They continue long into the night, in the still silence of dawn, there's no sound. Cade dares to check outside. I stay crouched under the flimsy table. When he calls my name, his voice sounds thick with a horror I share. Something's different at our campsite. We find blood dragged across the dusty ground, splattered against the tires, but there's no body. I don't ask, because it's clear what happened. In a daze, we climb inside, and Cade gets the engine running. A passerby was our rescuer, flagged them down in a daze along the roadside. The police were the next stop. I'm sure those folks thought we were delusional, ranting about animal prints and things. The report, if there is one, probably describes it as a possible mountain lion attack with some good old-fashioned rambling hiker trauma on top. Don't blame them. I sure as hell wish I could buy this simple explanation. We never went back to Basin and Range. I ain't going back to any wilderness without at least three buddies and a satellite phone. You better believe I keep an eye out even around here in my safe suburb when the light starts to go dim. Because something else lurks out there. This happened to me a few years back, during one of my regular solo ventures. See, I'm into long-distance backpacking. The more isolated, the better. It's about that push, finding some inner strength as much as it is about scenic routes. My name's Thaddeus, but everyone calls me Thad. This trip's goal, the Appalachian Trail, deep into the lush forests of northern Georgia. Had some decent weather reports, good enough to last five days or so. Now... You should know my style. Less about pre-planning, more about just winging it, finding a trailhead and hitting the ground running. That spontaneity led me to this off-the-beaten-path trail deep in the heart of the Chattahoochee Forest. Not much info available online, but damn if it didn't look perfect. That first day was pretty damn exhilarating. Steep ascents, dense undergrowth, it had everything I craved. But by evening, with a decent campsite located, fatigue hit hard. You don't realize how those little moments of adrenaline stack up. One minute you're setting up the tent, the next your flashlight's beam catches this thing. Movement, maybe 200 feet away, right on the edge of the tree line. My heart kicks up a notch. Big cat? That'd explain the stealth. What happens next, I still struggle to believe. It steps forward just slightly, giving me a partial profile against the dusk light. Tall, lanky, definitely not a bear or anything normal. Then it just vanishes into the brush. My brain plays tricks. Shadows of branches must have done it. The sense of unease remains, but after a good night's sleep, it feels like a strange, half-remembered dream. Day two starts off strong, and that initial weirdness fades. My usual pace is faster here. Maybe that initial unease had some residual influence on my subconscious. This trail, it winds, a lot, turns back on itself. My sense of direction, usually excellent, starts feeling off. But who cares when this kind of natural beauty surrounds you? 
I even joke out loud that if I keep walking in circles, that's just more time with these ancient trees. By third day in, that joke doesn't feel so funny anymore. It's subtle at first. Feeling eyes on me, an odd sense of deja vu with certain trail markers. But that nagging voice tells me it's my overactive imagination. When you do solo hikes, the mind finds weird little ways to entertain itself. Or maybe those woods get to you like that after a while. Then the clearing happened. Now, there was absolutely no indication that I'd come across this spot before. This was new territory. My route was meticulously outlined for just this scenario. No way should I have arrived back here, a wide, flat space ringed by towering pines. Yet, it felt so unsettlingly familiar. And at the far end, nestled right where the trail led back into the woods, was a structure. Not your run-of-the-mill hiker's shelter. Something older, a simple cabin. My curiosity overpowers any lingering caution. It turns out to be unlocked. The inside has this untouched quality, yet not abandoned. There are supplies, but dusty. Old newspapers with yellowed pages litter a side table. What pulls my focus, though, is this map tacked to the peeling wall. It's ancient, detailing these very woods. But some hand-drawn markings, scribbled arrows and notes. I feel the hairs on my neck stand on end. They trace a route that matches, almost exactly, my own haphazard wanderings through this dense forest. Now, alarm bells are blaring full force. This place, there's intention in that map. The cabin wasn't just discovered, it was sought out. My exit is quick, almost a scramble back into the sunlight. That familiar path unfurls into the pines, a mocking sign of normalcy compared to what lurked inside. That evening, it wasn't just the setting sun giving me an uneasy feeling. This was when I found it. That same damn lanky silhouette, stalking me just ahead, moving parallel to the trail, mirroring my every step. At least now there was clear sight of the thing. Long legs, almost unnaturally so, with this hunched gait. Then, for a chilling moment, it turns its head slightly in my direction. That face, if you can call it that. Like a smooth, featureless egg laid atop its shoulders. No eyes, no mouth. Nothing recognizable. Every cell in my body screamed to run, but some morbid fascination held me rooted. Then it was gone again, dissolving back into the dense undergrowth. By dawn, I'd packed camp at a speed bordering on manic. There was nowhere to go but ahead back down the trail that had led me into this mess. But by midday, it felt like every turn brought nothing new. My footsteps echoed against the same giants I'd been passing for days. I finally broke, yelling, probably more to convince myself I wasn't just insane. At least there was an answer, sort of. An odd sound, coming from up ahead, like nails against wood, only a slow, deliberate scratch. That damn cabin loomed up again. There, on the dusty porch, was some fresh movement. That hunched form, only something in its arms. My brain scrambled. Was it holding another person? No, the size was wrong, almost childlike. There was something shiny, catching the sunlight as it swayed slightly in that creature's grip. My blood ran cold. A deer antler, and hanging just beneath a torn scrap of blue nylon that matched the exact shade of my jacket. No question, it had caught my scent. The creature had tracked me for miles. My mind races back to that dusty map in the cabin. Was I simply its newest addition? A specimen to be tracked? Hunted? Who knows what twisted fate awaited me within those walls? That's my turning point. No way I was facing whatever waited inside that cabin. Instead, there was the dense forest, and with primal determination, I dove in. Every sense was on overload, every snapping twig a predator behind me. My legs burn, lungs aching, but fear propels me faster than I've ever moved. After what feels like a lifetime, a shimmer of pale road breaks through the green gloom. 
Never has civilization looked so damn sweet. Stumbling to the edge of that asphalt, hitching a ride with a wide-eyed truck driver, my only words were, please just keep driving. Now some folks have theories about backwoods cults or government experiments gone wrong. Me? I don't know what that thing was. What sick obsession drew it to that damn cabin in the woods? I just know my return route from there was deliberately vague. No one would believe me if I tried to explain the unmarked trails. There's a reason there was no trace of that place ever existing. Those old Appalachian woods might hide beauty, but they also hold dark secrets best left undisturbed. I still hike, but these days, I choose well-charted routes, those paths less likely to turn on you when you least expect it. It was the coldest November I had ever experienced, and I was starting to feel as if my bones had frozen. I'm Alex Porter, just your everyday man who was throwing a party at a rented cabin in the woods, somewhere in Oregon. My friends and I were just looking forward to a weekend away, eager to forget our work troubles and mundane lives. As we gathered around the bonfire, cracking jokes while enjoying the crisp evening air, everything felt normal wholeheartedly unaware of the terror that awaited us. So, Alex, Sarah began, do you have any funny or embarrassing stories from your childhood? I laughed heartily before recalling a hysterical memory which lifted everyone's spirits. It was a rare moment of warmth and joviality amidst the ominous chill enveloping us. It grew late when it became time to refill our cooler with ice from my Jeep. As I walked to my car parked further away from the now dim campfire, I noted that something felt amiss. The once lively sounds of the forest reduced to a suffocating silence. Clutching my flashlight like a lifeline, its weak beam projected a faint light amid the darkness, revealing only branches laden with fresh snow. As I stepped closer towards my vehicle and opened the trunk, my flashlight's beam found itself fixated on a pair of small black eyes staring at me. The inky void that filled their sockets turned my stomach. They belonged to two children, both seemingly ordinary, but for their unsettling eyes. Holding back panic, I stammered out shakily, Uh, hi there, um, can I help you? Their unnervingly wide smiles sent chills up my spine. My instincts screamed danger as I quickly grabbed ice and hastily slammed the trunk closed. The children didn't utter a single word, nor move from their spot just stood there with those sinister smiles plastered on their faces. My heart raced as I turned my back to them and hurried towards the safety of the firelight and my friends. Adrenaline fueled my return as I blurted out breathlessly, Guys, there are these weird kids by my car. They're just standing there, staring at us. The group exchanged puzzled looks before we decided to approach the jeep together, my flashlight illuminating the way. It became apparent these black-eyed children had vanished into thin air, leaving only our personal fears to keep us company. As we huddled close around the campfire that struggled in vain against impending gloom, we cautiously weighed our options. Thoughts of escape grew heavier with each passing second. Though emboldened by one another's presence, driving back to civilization seemed more daunting than barricading ourselves within cabin walls praying for daylight's safe embrace. However, this brief comfort proved fleeting as we entered. The inside of the cabin looked maliciously ransacked. Shattered picture frames and toppled furniture adorned every inch, while splintered wood mocked us from its tragic ruin. In the ensuing chaos, several friends ran outside to call for help. Their cries promptly silenced when they found their phones inoperable. Our collective anxieties escalated each time we'd hear something scratching against cabin walls. Convinced these ghastly children were lurking nearby. Outside, snow continued relentlessly, burying the surrounding forest under a thickening layer of white. Rations dwindled alongside our hope for deliverance, while sleep evaded our collectively watchful eyes, fearing the unpredictable manifestations of a child's twisted amusement. Those lingering hours seemed an eternity until finally, 
Morning broke as if a curtain rose on some twisted play, eager to reveal its climactic act. With every passing moment, the tension in the cabin became increasingly suffocating. Our attempts at maintaining some semblance of order fell apart as the echoes of scratches on the walls continued. Meals became a blur of hurried bites, and conversations reduced to hushed whispers, all consumed by fear of drawing the black-eyed children's attention. Eventually, it was Dave who couldn't take it anymore. He stood up abruptly and grabbed a flashlight. I'm going to find help. We can't stay here locked up like this. Who knows how long they'll toy with us, or when they'll strike again. His panic was contagious. Soon more friends volunteered to go with him. As a group of five, they set out into the snowstorm, ignoring my pleas for them to stay behind. As they disappeared into the blizzard, those who remained were left shivering, not from the cold, but from uncertainty. Hours ticked by painfully. We counted each minute as it dragged along. The scratching intensified. Then faint screams carried through on swirling snowflakes. Our friends were in danger. We knew that we must make our move too. Grabbing flashlights and anything we could use as makeshift weapons, we huddled together and ventured into the storm's relentless embrace. Navigating through climbing drifts and biting winds was exhausting. Our sole focus concentrated on following our friend's screams and putting distance between ourselves and that cursed cabin. As the cruel storm began to subside, we stumbled upon a horrific sight, an unnatural arrangement of dismembered limbs from our brave comrades who left earlier. Trembling uncontrollably, we recognized them by their clothes. Dave, Janet, Mark, all dead. Their eyes stared blankly into nothingness while their faces were twisted into expressions of absolute terror. Unable to process the atrocities inflicted upon our friends, fear urged us forward in search of help before suffering a similar fate. With every strength left in our battered bodies, we trudged through the snow, guided only by the desperate yearning to escape those black-eyed children. Miraculously, after what felt like an eternity, we saw twinkling lights in the distance. A village. Hope flared, a genuine chance to put the horrors of those gory, twisted monsters behind us. As we stumbled into town, drenched and shivering from our icy ordeal, a group of concerned villagers greeted us. Weary from our ordeal, they led us to the safety of a town hall, doubling as a shelter during the storm. During that traumatic night, we didn't sleep but snuggled together for warmth, each haunted by memories of our abandoned friends and that silent terror lurking in the forest. The following day, as we huddled around cups of hot coffee in the village's only café, a local police officer approached us. With furrowed brows, he listened in horrified disbelief as survivors recounted our harrowing experience. He offered reassurance promising that once roads cleared up, officers would venture to the cabin to investigate. Days turned into weeks and melted into months, an agonizing passage of time where the events at the cabin seemed nothing more than a bad dream. Life began resembling normalcy again, yet gone were our lighthearted spirits. More than once during this period of limbo, I went back to that place in my mind, the remote clearing shrouded by evergreens where terror took root. I thought back to those twisted smiles on their terrifying faces, wondering why they chose us and what they did with our friend's lifeless remains. The police never found anything. There were no trace left behind from those horrific nights, routing all evidence to oblivion's abyss. The only memory of those unfathomable horrors resided in survivors' ravaged minds, bound together by an unspoken understanding, taking solace in each other's silent company. Ever have one of those moments that make you realize just how mundane your morning coffee routine is? I was about to experience a disturbance to my daily grind that made instant coffee seem thrilling. I work for the U.S. government in a secretive role that involves genetic experiments. 
Specifically, my tasks are carried out at a facility hidden within the sprawling forests of the Pacific Northwest, so remote that even Google Maps gives up trying to locate it. My name is Mustafa Lemkin, and I'm no stranger to the bizarre and unexplainable, but what transpired was unlike anything even my extensive clearance could rationalize. My colleagues, including Jovita Keen, an expert in bioinformatics, and Dragan Ruzik, whose skills in molecular genetics were second to none, were with me when we found something particularly unsettling at the edge of our research perimeter. Dragan was examining something half-buried under crimson-soaked leaves, his brow furrowed. Mustafa, you ever see something like this in our work? He asked in his thick Eastern European accent. I crouched beside him to see a patterning of flesh and fur mangled in such a way that it resembled avant-garde art if one had a particularly grim taste. This wasn't an accident. It was calculated, dismemberment with precision that was chilling. Critter war's getting wild out here, Jovita offered dryly from behind us, her attempt at lightening the mood only making the hairs on my neck stand on end. Returning to our lab bunker meant trekking through the thicket where whispers from the wind felt like warning mutters. It was on one such return trip, our radio crackled with panic, an assistant from another department reporting sighting something near her station. Her last sentence cut off with a scream followed by silence. Cursing under our breaths, guns in hand, government issue for our unexpected wild neighbors, we hurried towards the location she'd described. Our comms were down. We couldn't call for backup or even alert anyone to what was happening. We found her workstation abandoned, papers fluttering into the wilderness like frightened birds taking flight. A trail of destruction led deeper into the woods, broken branches at unnatural heights and footprints unlike any wildlife indigenous to these parts. With each step further from safety, tension craved release in brash decisions, yet we moved with purposeful stealth. Awareness heightened, as though every sense had been sharpened by fear itself. I didn't sign up for fieldwork, Dragon muttered, his words almost a whisper against the backdrop of encroaching darkness. Nobody signs up for this kind of fieldwork, I responded, though my voice lacked conviction, a joke falling flat as if absorbed by impending dread. The trail ended abruptly before us as we emerged into a clearing illuminated by a natural skylight framed by towering pines. The clearing seemed untouched until I glimpsed something move, fast and fluid in the corner of my eye, a flash of what appeared like amalgamated animal features, yet utterly unfamiliar. It had detected us, too. Our unseen adversary seemed pervasive, the embodiment of every whispered folklore tale where wild things roam outside men's domain. Yet this was flesh and blood, it bled when Dragon's bullet grazed it after it lunged towards Jovita, who had strayed too close to its hidden vantage point. She fell back with a gasp while the creature retreated back into cover. Dragon checked his weapon as I pulled Jovita to her feet. Blood oozed from a gash on her arm where the creature had struck. We were scientists, not combatants ill-prepared for an assault by an unknown entity in a forest that had turned hostile. Mobile phones showed no service, a dead zone in the wilderness. We need to move, I said, probing our retreat path. Dragan nodded, helping Jovita along as we retraced our steps. The creature could be stalking us. Its dark silhouette was a blur of fur and muscle that could outmaneuver us with ease. The trek back was silent except for our hurried steps and the occasional rustle in the underbrush. We kept our gaze fixed behind us as much as forward, anticipating another attack. As we cleared the densest part of the woods, Dragon's foot caught on something. He fell forward, cursing under his breath. A trap, an improvised snare of sorts, had been set up with cunning simplicity. We cut him free but found no sign of our assailant. It was near dawn when we stumbled onto the road where our vehicle waited. We drove straight to the nearest hospital for Jovita's wound and contacted local authorities thereafter. The response was skepticism masked by feigned concern. 
they noted, but did not act. Days passed in a blur of medical checks and debriefings with faces that expressed disbelief at our account. Members of our research team departed one after another until solitude became my companion. Jovita moved to a different city. Dragan took indefinite leave from work. The incident left each of us altered, unable to reconcile our reality with what we faced in those woods. Official reports cataloged the encounter under unidentified animal attacks, though nothing like it had ever been documented or even rumored to exist. The forest reclaimed its silence as if nothing had ever trespassed upon its tranquility. I found no peace. Sleep gave way to restless nights and work became a distraction that barely managed to hold back the memory of those harrowing moments. But life had to continue. Unanswered questions lingered as whispers among leaves, a language without translation, an experience undocumented, yet undeniably real. We never returned to those woods, nor did we speak again of what happened that night. Our scars were remembrance enough. Jovita's wound healed, leaving behind faint lines etched into her skin, as if nature itself wanted us never to forget our transgression into its domain, where something lurked beyond human understanding. That flash of movement remains etched in my recollection. A creature birthed from Earth's hidden crevices with features defying categorization. A reminder that some secrets are closely guarded by nature's impassive facade. And sometimes, they reach out and touch those who dare tread too close. October 23rd, 1993. I always liked figuring out how things worked, so when my truck broke down halfway between nowhere and gone, the first thing I did was laugh. Guess living in a cabin out in the Alaskan wilderness meant getting used to fixing my own problems. My name's Silas, ex-mechanic, looking for some quiet after too many years spent under greasy hoods. Popped the hood, started poking around, engine wasn't making the usual bad noises, which meant an electrical glitch somewhere. While tracing wires, I heard a crash, like something big moving through the trees. Figured it was a moose, not uncommon around these parts. Kept my head down, figuring it would wander off. Then I smelled it. A sharp metallic tang, mixed with something rotten, like a gut pile left out too long. The hairs on my neck stood up. Whatever it was, it wasn't a moose. I eased slowly away from the truck, keeping an eye on the tree line. That's when I saw it. Hunched between two pines, easily eight feet tall, covered in coarse dark fur with a matted mane running down its back. Its long arms seemed to drag on the ground as it moved, and its head sat low on its shoulders, snout too long and pointed. But it was the eyes that got me yellow and slitted, gleaming with a cold intelligence. I stumbled backwards, tripping over a root. The creature let out a snarl like metal scraping metal and lunged. I scrambled to my feet, booked it towards the cabin, heart pounding so loud I was afraid the thing would hear it over my ragged breaths. I could hear it crashing through the undergrowth behind me, its snarls getting closer. My cabin wasn't much, one room, a wood stove, some basic supplies, but the door was solid. Slammed it shut, threw the deadbolt and collapsed, gasping for air. Outside, I heard the creature slamming against the walls, the hinges groaning ominously. It circled the cabin for hours, the rasping of its claws against the wood a constant, grating torment. As the sun began to set, the noises finally subsided. I didn't risk moving until full daylight. Opening the door, I saw the damage. Walls scored deep. The window by the woodpile cracked. And in the muddy ground, footprints. Not human, not bare, but clawed and heavy. Too long for anything I recognized. I took a steadying breath and went to work. Boarded up the broken window, reinforced the hinges on the door. I left the deadbolt off. If the thing came back, I didn't want it trapped inside with me. 
That afternoon, I hiked out to my emergency supply cache, stashed a few miles away. Grabbed spare ammo, my old military-issue survival kit, and shouldered the heavy pack. The truck sat where I left it, the hood still up. I did a quick repair on the busted ignition wires, good enough to get it rolling. Packed the essentials and got the hell out of there. Stopped at the nearest town with a general store. Told the owner I'd been chased off by a brown bear. Needed some ammo for my rifle. He eyed me suspiciously, but sold me the shells. Locals around here are used to keeping to themselves. Maybe they've seen things too. Things they don't put a name to. Never went back to that cabin. Even now, truck engines don't rattle me the way the sound of claws on wood does. Sometimes out on the road when the shadows stretch long across the asphalt, I catch a whiff of that rotten meat smell, and a shiver runs down my spine. I look in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a hulking shape, eyes gleaming in the twilight. I got a small trailer now, the kind you can tow behind a truck. Keep it packed and hitched up. I still take mechanic jobs for folks in remote towns, but I never stay too long. They call me a drifter, and I suppose they're right. But sleeping behind a different steering wheel every night feels a whole lot safer. Folks up here, some of the old-timers, they whisper stories of the Adlet, a creature from Inuit legends, a monstrous mix of man and wolf. Maybe that's what I saw. Maybe it has other names, in other places, other shadowed corners of the map. All I know is... Out there in the wild, lonesome places, there are things older than our names for them, with a hunger that doesn't care what we call them back. This happened to me a couple of years back, right around that time in life when weekend getaways with the guys just started feeling routine, you know? Still fun, but less of an adventure. Name's Noah, by the way. Used to be a bit of a city rat. Noisy apartment takeout every night. Till work stressed me out so bad I had to make a change. Got into hiking, biking, all that healthy nature stuff. Figured why not try an actual camp out for once. My buddy Declan, bless his adventurous spirit, found this awesome website claiming to list undiscovered camping spots. The one that caught our eye was a secluded clearing deep in the Ozarks. Missouri side, near a winding river. No crowds, no park rangers, no nothing. Just us and the open skies. Sounded too good to be true to this city boy, but I was up for it. It was a long drive in Declan's beat-up old RV, packed full of supplies. It took longer than we thought to get to the remote access road, and even by then, the sun was fading fast. Should have called it a night right there. But the call of the wild and all that. There was a rough clearing just barely big enough for the RV, surrounded by these gnarled pine trees. Didn't take long to set up camp. A few folding chairs, basic supplies out. Declan insisted on messing with his telescope while there was still some light. Me? I wanted to push ahead, do some exploring. The website mentioned a trail system nearby. It's funny how quickly ambition fades when the light disappears and the woods loom over you. That's when I started to think maybe staying near the RV wouldn't be so bad. Declan laughed at me, but even he must have felt it. That nagging chill that wasn't the evening air. I head off down a worn path, phone flashlight flickering uselessly against the trees. Shouldn't have gone solo. Should have waited for daylight, but... That familiar craving for a little exploration got the better of me. That thrill of being away from it all, from work, routine, noise, people. The first half hour goes fine, just the gentle creaks you expect from the forest. And then, I see it. At first, it's just a lean-to propped against a massive oak. But there's something off about it. Fabric too old and worn for any modern camper. Branches propped too tight against the tree like it was built as a makeshift shelter and left untouched for ages. That's when it hits me. An iron tang in the air. The stench of rotting meat. There are clothes strewn across the ground, 
tattered and muddy, some soaked in dark splotches I don't even want to imagine. And right next to that makeshift camp, something large, wrapped in ripped, dark canvas. Something still. I should have run then, called for Declan, anything. But there's a morbid curiosity burning within me, the need to figure out what the hell happened here. I inch closer, phone beam catching at the canvas tarp, and that's when I notice the boots peeping out. Now this is where my brain and body disagree. The sensible part yells, Get out of there! The other part just freezes. Can't speak. Can't move. It's as if every part of me knows there's danger nearby, but my fear is too overwhelming to do anything except stand there gawking. The boots don't budge. There's no breathing. Not even the rise and fall of a chest. Finally, something clicks. That body was dead for sure. The smell overpowering now. Something or someone left him and whatever other poor soul set up camp here to rot. My mind races through all the stories I'd heard about folks mysteriously disappearing in national parks, and suddenly I am running through those trees, legs screaming, flashlight bobbing wildly. It feels like it takes forever, but then I see the glimmer of our campsite ahead. I burst through the trees, yelling for Declan. I stop short. He's staring through his telescope, perched on his camping chair like nothing is wrong. You gotta see this, Noah, he points upward. Orion's right. Suddenly, he notices the wild look in my eyes. I gasp, trying to get words out, and point wildly back at the trees. Declan finally jumps off his chair, confused. Then, from what felt like right behind us, comes a blood-curdling scream. It's not human, and it's definitely not an animal I've ever heard. There's a rustling nearby, snapping branches, something moving at impossible speed. We both just stare, paralyzed. There's another scream, and in a flash, Declan turns and bolts for the RV. My body finally kicks into gear, and I run right behind him. No fancy plan, just a desperate scramble into that rickety RV. I barely make it through the door before I hear a thump against the side, metal groaning followed by that screech again. Declan slams the gas pedal, lurching us backwards enough to throw me on the floor. My head hits hard against the cabinet, blurring my vision for a second. It takes every ounce of strength to pull myself up. When I can finally focus, I see Declan peering frantically out the windshield. I scramble beside him, and we both gasp at the same time. There's a man standing near the edge of the clearing, tall, emaciated, and clothes barely hanging off him. His skin seems gray in the faint moonlight, and his eyes, they glow an unnerving amber color fixed on the RV. It's hard to make out details through the streaked glass, but there's something unsettlingly animalistic about the way he hunches, almost predatory. It's like he knows we're looking senses us staring with absolute terror. I hear a scratch against the door, fingernails or something else sharp and bony. Another horrifying scream echoes through the woods. Then, Declan's shaking hands manage to put the RV in gear and he guns it out of there, tires spitting dirt and gravel. My head swims, blood trickling from where I hit the cabinet, but I don't dare take my eyes off that terrifying figure in the flickering headlights. He doesn't give chase, just stands there watching us, perfectly still as we speed off into the dark. For a terrifying moment, I think maybe we're safe after all. We manage to make it back to the rough access road, where that sliver of civilization brings me some small shred of hope. Then, from somewhere in the dense trees beside the road, the screaming starts again. There's another loud shriek and we hear a crash just moments before something massive leaps onto the roof of the RV, metal screeching, fiberglass crunching. Declan swerves madly, nearly tipping us into the ditch. Whatever it is on our roof, it's heavy, clawing at us, ripping into the vehicle like a starving animal. We don't stop. I barely even take a breath. Declan floors it, tires spinning and kicking up mud. There are thuds against the sides, bone against metal, 
more of those inhuman cries slicing through the night. I try to look back, see what's attacking us, but the forest flashes past too quickly in the dim light. The RV starts to fill with an awful stink, the same rotting smell from the campsite. Finally, after what feels like forever, we hit the main road. It feels like freedom, like maybe, just maybe, we made it out. We don't slow down until we see the lights of a highway rest stop, and only then do we dare to pull over. The damage to the RV is extensive, deep scratches running the length of it, windows cracked and leaking. My heart throbs at the idea of what we barely escaped. We barely speak until we find a gas station and stumble inside to call the police. They don't find anything out there, except some ravaged campsites and scattered personal effects. The look on the officers' faces speaks louder than words. After that, the drive home is a blur. Neither of us really want to talk about what we saw. Every dark shadow along the highway sparks the same terror. Even after I shower and lie awake in my own bed, I imagine the smell following me. Imagine those glowing eyes burning into me from the corner of my room. Declan doesn't respond to my texts or calls. The news whispers of missing locals, disappearances explained away vaguely as animal attacks. I know better. We both know better. It's become hard to find peace in the outdoors. I still take hikes, forced by some sense of routine, but I never stray far from the trail. There's a voice in the back of my head reminding me that darkness hides more than just unseen roots and unseen rocks. That somewhere out there, just beyond the edge of human understanding, that man and whatever attacked us still exist. The wild doesn't seem so adventurous anymore. This happened to me a few years ago when I was 20-something and still into weekend backpacking adventures. That particular summer, a few old pals from high school decided to try something different. An RV trip along the Pacific Coast Highway. Funny enough, none of us had an RV. That's where Dacre comes in. His parents let him borrow theirs on account of the promise that nothing reckless happens. Of course, Dacre didn't hesitate to make that very promise. So, with Dacre at the wheel of the behemoth rig, along with Brietta, Tristan, and myself, Ridley, we set off with our sights set on California's coastal redwoods. The thing about traveling the coast highway is that the best campsites aren't the big roadside RV centers. The real beauty is tucked away in little pullouts nestled within the national forests and state parks. About midway through, we discovered our spot a breathtaking clearing beside a stream just off the beaten path in Samuel P. Taylor State Park. It felt too good to be true. Spacious, flat, shaded. The ideal spot to chill for a couple of days. It didn't take long to establish a routine. Mornings were for leisurely hiking among the redwoods. Afternoons were filled with a mix of relaxation, naps, and splashing in the chilly stream. Nights were for stories by the campfire, beers, the standard stuff. This one night, though, this one was different. We'd finished dinner, and while everyone else hung by the fire, something just felt... off. It was subtle at first, but this sense of being watched kept gnawing at me. Now, you need to understand, I'm not the type to get spooked easily. Chalk it up to spending so much time alone while hiking solo or something... I have a high tolerance for the occasional nighttime forest sound. But that nagging feeling kept building. This prickly paranoia on the back of my neck. After nearly an hour, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Hey guys, I finally piped up. Anyone else feel like we're being watched? I saw Brietta glance up, her features drawn and a bit hesitant. Dacre scoffed. Nah, dude, you're just paranoid. This place is deserted. Even Tristan... Ever the chill one of the group gave me a questioning look. Despite their words, I refused to shake the feeling. Every crackle of a twig, every rustling leaf, made me jump. I'm heading to bed, I announced, standing abruptly. I'd had enough and needed to be in the enclosed space of the RV. The others mumbled agreements, 
already lost in their conversations. Inside the RV, with the curtains drawn, I tried to convince myself I was being silly. After all, there were probably hundreds of perfectly logical explanations for my unease. Wind in the trees, nocturnal animals, that sort of thing. Yet, no matter how I tried to rationalize it, that unshakable sense of wrongness lingered. As I curled up, intending to sleep it off, I heard it. It was a soft scratching sound coming from beneath the RV. My blood ran cold. It was definitely an animal, probably a big one from the sound of it. Was it a mountain lion? I held my breath, the scratching suddenly closer, right under the bedroom window. Then, silence. Relief briefly washed over me until I heard a soft thud right outside the door. In that moment, my mind did something wild. My logical voice told me there was no way it was rational, but this undeniable certainty washed over me. That thud was from something standing upright, something walking like a person. Suddenly, I caught a flicker through the curtainless bathroom window. There, against the moonlight, was a tall, emaciated silhouette. Everything in me went rigid with terror. I had this absurd notion that if I didn't make eye contact, it wouldn't know I was awake. It sounds ridiculous now, but that's what pure terror does to you. The figure didn't linger. A moment later, I heard heavy footsteps retreating into the trees. Still unable to move, I strained my ears against the thumping of my heart. Was it truly gone? After what felt like hours, the only sound came from the relentless pounding of my own pulse. Part of me doubted myself. Maybe I'd misheard something. Maybe I'd dreamt it. Another primal part screamed that what I'd seen was real. Whatever it was, I hadn't been mistaken about one thing. It was dangerous. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream shattered the forest tranquility. Brietta. I scrambled into the driver's seat, throwing the RV into gear. With shaking hands, I slammed down the accelerator. Branches whipped against the side mirrors, headlights illuminating the winding forest trail. That thing from the shadows was out there, somewhere. Dacre and Tristan stumbled out of the camper looking bewildered and sleep-dazed. Between gasps, I managed to spill my story. The watching, the scratching, the figure I'd seen. I half expected Dacre to brush it off as more paranoia, but his face grew pale when he heard Brietta's scream. From across the clearing, we heard another terrifying wail cut short. Now we all knew. This wasn't my overactive imagination. Get in! I yelled, pushing the gas pedal to the floor. My mind raced with frantic possibilities. Should we head to the highway? try to get a signal, find help? Or would that creature out there wait and ambush us as we left the safety of the trees? Fear had me so knotted up I could barely think straight. Suddenly, Dacre shouted from the back, Brietta's gone! My stomach sank. Even over the engine noise, I could hear Tristan sobbing beside him. My mind filled with terrifying images. Brietta dragged off into the night, helpless beneath the claws and teeth of whatever stalked us. Fueled by pure terror, fueled by grief, I made a split-second decision. Back to the campsite, I snarled, wheeling the RV sharply back towards the clearing. Dacre and Tristan screamed protests, but I knew. Whatever had Brietta was heading directly back to where this had begun. As we burst back into the clearing, bathed in the harsh glare of the floodlights, we saw it. Brietta lay lifeless, her clothes ripped and matted with blood. The creature crouched over her. It was monstrous, skeletal, but with powerful muscles rippling beneath its taut, translucent skin. The face was sunken, gaunt, yet with unnervingly human eyes and jagged, distended teeth. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before and as it lifted its head and met my gaze, its lips contorting into something terrifyingly close to a grin, I realized this wasn't a predator hunting for food. This was something darker. I put my foot down, slamming the RV straight into the monster. 
For a fleeting, sickening moment, it was pinned between the vehicle and a redwood tree. But the creature was impossibly strong. It let out a guttural howl and lurched free, leaving a smear of bloody flesh on the bark and a twisted hunk of metal on the RV's crumpled frame. That bought us the second we needed. I roared out of the clearing, leaving our campsite of horrors behind. We didn't even bother packing, only grabbing the keys from the abandoned tents. I drove for hours, my adrenaline-fueled haze only allowing me to follow the curving highway ahead. The headlights painted a tunnel through the darkness, but somehow, I knew that behind us, something even more horrifying lurked. We made it to a sleepy coastal town just as the sky began to lighten. I remember pulling into some anonymous parking lot, slumping in the driver's seat. Tristan cried softly in the back, while Dacre sat unnaturally still, his gaze blank with utter shock. That's when the emergency siren sounded. We told the police everything, but with each halting word, their expressions shifted from concern to pity, and then something worse. Disbelief. Search parties never found a trace of Brietta or the creature I described. Life after that never really went back to normal. Some nights I close my eyes and see that gaunt face in the window, that inhuman grin. When the wind whispers through the trees, I jolt awake in a cold sweat, certain of one thing. Some creatures aren't born from myths and legends, and neither are true nightmares. The month was July 1998 when I stepped into the small town of Oak Ridge, Oregon. See, I just inherited a quaint little cabin from my great-aunt Maxine. A familiar smile formed on my lips as I thought about how she loved her puns, saying this cabin would always keep me cozy and hospitable. Yep, hospitable as a host pitable for termites that were devouring the wooden porch plank by plank. My predicament began when I visited Frank's Hardware to purchase supplies for mending the cabin's run-down porch. As I roamed the store looking for nails and wood, I bumped into Sarah Parker and Jake Thompson. The trio chatted with local gossip dominating most of it. It was then that they mentioned the bizarre urban legend surrounding our neck of the woods. They spoke in hushed tones, partly out of fear and partly so they wouldn't be overheard by old Ms. Jenkins who had overly sensitive hearing. Apparently black-eyed children roamed these parts, no older than twelve years old. Townsfolk never looked directly into those soulless eyes filled with emptiness, or so they assumed, for no one described what lay beyond. Fascinated, but not genuinely fearful, life went on, and my cabin started taking a more solid shape day by day. One peculiar night, though, when I ventured off into the woods to take measurements for an extension alongside my cabin, something bizarre happened. It was around 9 p.m. The moon provided just enough light to see my trusty cabin from a distance. I felt the tension build up in the air as goosebumps raised on my arms as if sensing an unseen presence. As I turned around to head back to my cabin, there they were. Two children standing unnervingly close with their faces partially hidden under their hoods. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I channeled my dormant sense of humor for some solace. Do you kids have a curfew to catch? Or are you part of that black-eyed children club I keep hearing about? I joked shakily. They didn't speak a word. Seeming to realize there was no potential laughter coming from them, I cleared my throat and said, all right then, kids. You should go home before your parents get worried. Not waiting for any reply or reaction, I started back towards my cabin. Entering the once cozy abode, I felt an unsettling feeling gnaw at me. Sarah Parker and Jake Thompson's waning voices filled with apprehension as they shared the town's haunted urban legends replayed in my mind. Crushed by an uncanny wave of foreboding that twisted my gut into knots, I locked every door and window in the cabin, making it as tight as a fortress. Sleep was uneasy that night. The sound of footsteps outside my bedroom window slowly grew louder and more persistent. My heart skipped a beat 
as I saw a small shadow cast through the gap in the curtain. Gripped by a cold sweat, blurry images flashed through my brain. Distorted memories of those children I had encountered earlier that evening. A peculiar smell wafted through the air, something between burnt rubber and rotting flesh. I remembered Sarah's words while recounting the legend about looking directly into those black orbs devoid of life, seeming to have developed an affinity for risk since inheriting this cabin, busting yet another dead joke, freezing halfway through it due to nerves straightening under her vocal cords. I guess there's no such thing as free food even after you die. Almost mockingly dropped it, attempting to break the menacing silence enveloped around her home like a thick, opaque fog wringing her fingers nervously before slightly, very slightly, pulling aside the curtain. There, lit by the bright moonlight, was the face of one of the children. The hood partly concealed their face as they stared intently into my cabin. It slowly raised its head, and my earlier mockery seemed a flimsy defense against what I saw next. I shuddered, fighting the urge to mask the fear that took hold of me those pitch-black eyes with no discernible whites or irises bore into me. My instinct screamed at me to run, but my legs refused to move. I couldn't take my eyes off the child's face, those unnatural black eyes radiating an eerie feeling that seemingly immobilized me. Without giving any warning, the child let out a high-pitched screech, causing me to flinch and finally regain control of my limbs. I stumbled away from the window with only one thought in mind. Escape. My phone was charging on the kitchen counter, and even though there were still no guarantees it would work due to poor reception in this remote area, I grasped it tightly as if it were a lifeline. Desperate attempts filled the line with more silence. No signal. I quickly ran to the back door, locked, thrashing against it with all my might knowing full well that my only escape route was now through the front door. Making sure all lights were off, I edged towards the front door when I heard rustling footsteps growing closer. As I prepared myself for what was waiting outside, I braced myself. With a deep breath, I turned the knob and flung open the door. There they were, Jake and Sarah, along with several other children, their black eyes glared at me menacingly, grins stretching unnaturally wide as they slowly approached. I slammed the door closed again as sheer panic took over. They weren't human, that much was clear, but what could they possibly be? Despite all appearances of being children, these creatures were undoubtedly dangerous, and they wanted me for some unknown reason. Desperate thoughts raced through my mind while looking for a means of escape. Silently praying help would miraculously appear. My cries for aid seemed to have been heard because as I slumped against the cabin wall dejectedly, police sirens echoed in the distance. The creatures must have heard them too because their collective sinister snickering ceased abruptly. A moment of tense silence followed as a sudden pounding on the door reverberated through the cabin. Police! Open up! A deep, authoritative voice rang out. With trembling hands, I unlatched the door. Two officers stood before me, their expressions mirroring surprise as they took in my disheveled appearance. Are you all right? The first officer asked with genuine concern while scanning the surroundings, as if expecting an attacker to appear. I tried to articulate what had transpired, but found my words failing since the ordeal seemed entirely absurd. Eventually, I managed to stammer out a fragmented account of what had occurred. The officers exchanged skeptical glances but agreed to search the area around the cabin. Despite their attempts at reassuring me everything would be fine and that it was probably just my imagination playing tricks on me after hearing the local folklore, I knew without a doubt that what I had experienced was real. After completing their search, they found no trace of the children or any indication that anyone had been near my cabin. The officers offered me an escort back to town for safety, as I fervently agreed, relief washing over me, and gathered my belongings hastily. As we drove away from the cabin, I couldn't help but cast one last look back at the place where those children 
had haunted me. Part of me knew they were still out there, lurking in the shadows. Jake Thompson and Sarah Parker never returned home. Their disappearances were chalked up as another unsolved mystery surrounding this small forest town. I returned to my city life and tried going back to normalcy, but whenever I closed my eyes, I saw those black orbs devoid of life staring back at me, always wondering, were they human once? And worse, more than anything, did they still lurk in dark corners, waiting for their next opportunity? This happened to me on October 6, 2010. You ever spend too long alone and start to hear your own name whispered in the wind? That's where things started to go sideways for me. Name's Cal. Cal Weaver. I've been living out in the Adirondacks for close to 15 years now. Picked up the land cheap after my divorce left me with nothing but a truckload of tools and a need to get away from, well, people. Built myself a cabin. Got a few solar panels one of those satellite internet boxes. Modern off-grid, I guess you'd call it. I hunt, I fish, I fix up old motorcycles when I can get parts. It's a simple sort of life, but I like it. Or I liked it. Before. It started with the whispers. At first, I chalked it up to isolation playing tricks on my mind. Maybe it was the wind sighing through the pines in just the right way. But that voice kept getting clearer. Sounded like my name. Cal. Cal. Raspy and faint. Right on the edge of hearing. That's when the other stuff started happening. Little things, but unsettling. My tools would go missing, then turn up in odd places. Halfway down the trail, on the roof of the shed, places I wouldn't leave them. My fishing lines would get tangled in impossible knots. Once, I swore I saw my empty chair rocking on the porch when I came in from the woods. Thought I was going nuts. Old man losing his grip. Then came the noises. Scraping sounds at night. Like something dragging along the cabin walls. Heavy thumps on the roof that sent my heart pounding. And that smell. Musky, rank, like rotting meat left out in the sun. I tried to convince myself it was just an animal. Maybe a fisher cat had gotten into the woodshed. But it lingered too long. Too strong. One morning I went out to the garden and found chaos. Bean vines ripped up. Tomatoes stomped to mush. And in the center of it all, a footprint. Wasn't human. Too big for that. And the wrong shape with long, splayed toes ending in ragged claws. Panic set in then. I wasn't dealing with a critter. I was dealing with something else. I started making preparations. Boarded up the lower windows of the cabin, reinforced the doors, cleaned and loaded my old hunting rifle, the one I never thought I'd need to use on something more dangerous than a bear. That nagging voice was a near constant whisper now, carrying on the wind or seeping through the walls. Sometimes I'd hear a soft chuckle right outside my window making my skin crawl. Then, a few nights later, I saw it for the first time. I was up late, the whispering louder than ever. Glanced out the window, and there it was, silhouetted against the moonlight. It stood on two legs, tall and rangy, but hunched forward like an ape. Its skin looked hairless, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The head... God, the head was the worst... Long and narrow, with a jaw that jutted out unnaturally, full of crooked teeth glistening in the moonlight. And the eyes, empty black pits reflecting the light, fixed on my cabin, like the eyes of a damned shark. It watched me for what felt like hours, then melted back into the trees with a speed that defied its clumsy build. The next morning, I found more of those clawed footprints circling the cabin, Whatever it was, it was testing me, toying with me like a cat with a mouse. The next few days were a blur of fear and adrenaline. I barely slept, barricaded in my cabin with the rifle loaded and at hand. 
the whispering turned into snarls and grunts outside my door. It began to ram the walls, trying to force its way in. Then, it got smart. It cut my power line, plunging the house into darkness. I waited, rifle at the ready, listening to the snuffling breaths beyond my door. It tried one window, then the next, the wood creaking under its assault. But the bars held. After a while, it fell silent. Relief washed over me, then dread. This wasn't over. It was just changing tactics. Now, it was a waiting game. In the morning, I ventured out cautiously. The air was thick with that rotten meat smell, almost overpowering. And there, at the edge of the woods, it had left a message. A deer carcass, gutted and skinned, hanging from a branch. A grotesque mockery of my own hunting trophies. That's when I knew I couldn't stay. I packed what I could carry, grabbed the rifle, and just ran. I ran through the woods, not caring where I was going, just away from that cabin, away from that... thing. I kept hearing rustling behind me, the whisper of my name on the breeze, but I never looked back. Made it to the nearest road after a day and a half, flagged down a passing truck. The trucker thought I was some kind of escaped lunatic. Maybe I was. Called the police, told them my story. They sent some officers out to the cabin, but they didn't find any sign of forced entry, no animal tracks, nothing. Put it down to a hermit losing his mind in the woods. Let me tell you, being told you're crazy is almost worse than being stalked by a monster. It's been years now. I live in a cramped apartment in Albany, the noise of the city a constant drone that drowns out the whispers. I work at a warehouse, keep my head down. Never been back to those woods, never will. But sometimes, late at night, I smell that rotting stench creeping in under my windows, carried by the city breeze, and I hear a faint, raspy voice carried on the wind. Cal? Cal? Some folks, they hear my story and call it a case of wilderness psychosis, or maybe a bear acting peculiar. Some believe in Bigfoot, say it must have been one of those. Me? I don't try to put a name to it anymore. The world's bigger and wilder than we think, and there's things in the dark corners most of us are lucky enough never to see. The locals up in those mountains, they have a name for it. In hushed tones. The rake, they call it. Whatever it is, I pray I never see it again. This happened to me a long time ago, I guess maybe ten years back now. Me and my buddy Kellen spent most summers fishing, hiking, or camping out somewhere along the Pacific coast. We both grew up on the shores of Southern California, and you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys more in love with the open wilderness. Back then, I had an interest in photography, just messing around, nothing serious. Kellen knew that. So, when he decided to head up the coast and try out a new, secluded stretch of the Olympic National Park in Washington State, he asked me to come along and document the beauty. Naturally, I jumped at the chance. One sunny morning we packed up my old RV. It was nothing fancy, but it made those cross-country adventures a whole lot more comfortable. It wasn't exactly an off-road beast, but with Kellen behind the wheel, we had faith. After driving north across the Oregon state line, we turned west, venturing away from the paved highway onto a less certain path. The further along those dirt roads we got, the denser the forest became. Massive fir trees towered over the RV on both sides, their thick canopy almost entirely blotting out the sun. An occasional logging road wound off here and there, but we stayed the course on the wider unpaved track. As much as I loved the woods, my gut was sending off signals telling me we were straying a bit too far from civilization. We eventually did find a place to pull over, barely any wider than the RV itself. There was a tiny creek running nearby, making it about as idyllic of a spot as we could have hoped for. The first day went off without a hitch. 
We took a short hike down a nearby trail that had seen significantly more foot traffic than our makeshift road in, snapped a few shots at sunset, roasted some hot dogs over a crackling fire. Pretty classic first day for one of our trips. It had been so long since we had a summer to indulge in these wilderness escapes, so we savored it. Morning came just as we hoped it would, serene, the air clear and crisp with the faint smell of pine. After a quick breakfast, I grabbed my camera bag and Kellen shouldered his fishing gear. It was time to make good on our adventure. My plan was to wander about, photographing whatever sparked my interest while my buddy tried his luck in the creek. We figured two hours tops before meeting back at the RV for lunch. For quite a while, it was smooth sailing. I found plenty of fascinating fungi to photograph along the banks of the creek. Moss hung low from massive trunks in a dazzling show of nature's handiwork. Even just wandering in aimless loops around our campsite presented captivating visuals. I'd been so caught up, I only vaguely noticed time passing. A glance at my watch jolted me. We'd been apart far longer than anticipated. Concerned about Kellen, I started hollering his name, hoping like hell my voice would carry through the thick trees. No answer. I pushed the unease down and began heading toward the sound of the creek, figuring he must have just lost track of time chasing trout upstream. That's when I saw the first sign something was terribly wrong. I stumbled upon one of Kellen's fishing rods. It lay snagged in some foliage right on the path. My unease blossomed into full-blown dread. He wouldn't just leave his gear behind. Kellen was a bit of a fanatic, taking meticulous care of all his outdoor equipment. I called out again, this time adding in a bit about finding his rod. Still nothing. I took a deep breath, trying to keep a level head. Accidents weren't impossible, after all. Maybe he fell and banged his head? Sprained an ankle? With those possibilities dancing through my mind, I sprinted in the direction of the creek, praying Kellen had taken an unfortunate spill but nothing worse. I crashed through the trees, following the familiar gurgle of the running water. It was hard to tell how far I'd gone. Panic and adrenaline pumped through me, distorting my perception of time and distance. And then, there it was. An open stretch of ground lay right on the creek bank. Not wide, no more than about fifteen feet across. A few old fishing spots could be made out near the water's edge where trampled grass clung to the muddy earth. It looked like somewhere folks might go to cast a line from time to time. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing. Unless you took in the whole scene. There, splayed amongst the dirt, bits of fabric. Kellen's neon green t-shirt hung half in and half out of the creek, snagged on a jutting rock. The bottom hem stained a deep, dark red. I recognized the shirt instantly. He'd only packed the one. Just a few feet away, trampled into the ground, were Kellen's sunglasses and hat. Scattered about, I could only pick out small items. Bits of metal. Pieces of plastic that may have been part of a pocket knife. And more cloth. Too much cloth. Kellen was gone. And from the looks of things, he hadn't left willingly. I barely felt my knees give way as I staggered back into the undergrowth. Something wasn't right. Nothing felt right about this. Every bit of my being screamed it. No bear, cougar, or other forest-dwelling predator would attack like this. It all seemed planned. Methodical, even. Something out there. Some person had snatched my friend. But why? This thought sent a fresh wave of sickening fear coursing through me. If they'd gone after Kellen with those intentions, it wouldn't be long before they got wind of me. I had to get out of there. There was a ranger station. I couldn't be all that far from the trailhead. Surely someone could help. Turning blindly, I broke into a desperate run back towards the sound of the creek. It became a guide a way forward from the horrors I couldn't allow myself to dwell on. My lungs burned, each desperate gasp mingling with sobs threatening to burst. Every twisted root in my path held the potential for me to go face first into the tangled ground. Every snap of a twig sent a fresh stab of panic through me. Then, 
a sound that wasn't natural, something big moving through the brush ahead. A figure stepped out, blocking my path, and my body came to a shuddering halt. He was immense, easily seven feet tall, though hunched over in a posture that would be impossible for most men. His clothes were ragged, patched together in a mismatch of browns and rough denim. An old hunter's cap crowned his head, greasy strands of his dark hair peeking out at odd angles. But that wasn't what registered most immediately. No, it was the weathered leather, stretched, twisted, and formed into a mask covering his entire face. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but warped contours in tanned hide. I couldn't breathe, could barely scream, just stared in abject terror. Suddenly, he lunged. I turned with a strangled cry, legs finally taking action after the initial fear froze me in place. Every sound magnified now, the crunch of damp leaves under my pounding feet, the whistling of my breaths, the distant howl of a dog back toward the road. He followed close behind, the gap never seeming to widen. With some burst of animal energy, I managed to reach the road and scramble into the driver's seat of the RV. He appeared as suddenly as I felt the keys drop from my fingers and clatter behind a pedal. His hulking frame was practically pressed against the window as I tried to fumble for the ignition. Finally, the engine whined to life. Slamming the RV into drive, I stomped the gas, a desperate lurch nearly sending me careening into the dense forest on the other side of the road. That summer ended forever in that single moment. We never found Kellen, or any explanation for what happened in those deep woods. For months, maybe even years after, I refused to speak of it, even to myself. And now I wonder what happened to the leather-masked monstrosity. It couldn't have stayed confined to that wilderness forever. Did it claim more victims? Does it stalk the dark forest still? It chills me to think about and to wonder if my path will ever cross with those shadowed trees and that towering figure waiting beneath them once again. This happened to me a long time ago. I guess maybe ten years back now. Me and my buddy Kellen spent most summers fishing, hiking, or camping out somewhere along the Pacific coast. We both grew up on the shores of Southern California, and you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys more in love with the open wilderness. Back then, I had an interest in photography, just messing around, nothing serious. Kellen knew that. So, when he decided to head up the coast and try out a new, secluded stretch of the Olympic National Park in Washington State, he asked me to come along and document the beauty. Naturally, I jumped at the chance. One sunny morning, we packed up my old RV. It was nothing fancy, but it made those cross-country adventures a whole lot more comfortable. It wasn't exactly an off-road beast, but with Kellen behind the wheel, we had faith. After driving north across the Oregon state line, we turned west, venturing away from the paved highway onto a less certain path. The further along those dirt roads we got, the denser the forest became. Massive fir trees towered over the RV on both sides, their thick canopy almost entirely blotting out the sun. An occasional logging road wound off here and there, but we stayed the course on the wider, unpaved track. As much as I loved the woods, my gut was sending off signals telling me we were straying a bit too far from civilization. We eventually did find a place to pull over, barely any wider than the RV itself. There was a tiny creek running nearby, making it about as idyllic of a spot as we could have hoped for. The first day went off without a hitch. We took a short hike down a nearby trail that had seen significantly more foot traffic than our makeshift road in, snapped a few shots at sunset, roasted some hot dogs over a crackling fire. Pretty classic first day for one of our trips. It had been so long since we had a summer to indulge in these wilderness escapes, so we savored it. Morning came just as we hoped it would, serene, 
the air clear and crisp with the faint smell of pine. After a quick breakfast, I grabbed my camera bag and Kellen shouldered his fishing gear. It was time to make good on our adventure. My plan was to wander about, photographing whatever sparked my interest while my buddy tried his luck in the creek. We figured two hours tops before meeting back at the RV for lunch. For quite a while, it was smooth sailing. I found plenty of fascinating fungi to photograph along the banks of the creek. Moss hung low from massive trunks in a dazzling show of nature's handiwork. Even just wandering in aimless loops around our campsite presented captivating visuals. I'd been so caught up, I only vaguely noticed time passing. A glance at my watch jolted me. We'd been apart far longer than anticipated. Concerned about Kellen, I started hollering his name, hoping like hell my voice would carry through the thick trees. No answer. I pushed the unease down and began heading toward the sound of the creek, figuring he must have just lost track of time chasing trout upstream. That's when I saw the first sign something was terribly wrong. I stumbled upon one of Kellen's fishing rods. It lay snagged in some foliage right on the path. My unease blossomed into full-blown dread. He wouldn't just leave his gear behind. Kellen was a bit of a fanatic, taking meticulous care of all his outdoor equipment. I called out again, this time adding in a bit about finding his rod. Still nothing. I took a deep breath, trying to keep a level head. Accidents weren't impossible after all. Maybe he fell and banged his head? Sprained an ankle? With those possibilities dancing through my mind, I sprinted in the direction of the creek, praying Kellen had taken an unfortunate spill, but nothing worse. I crashed through the trees, following the familiar gurgle of the running water. It was hard to tell how far I'd gone. Panic and adrenaline pumped through me, distorting my perception of time and distance. And then, there it was. An open stretch of ground lay right on the creek bank, not wide, no more than about fifteen feet across. A few old fishing spots could be made out near the water's edge where trampled grass clung to the muddy earth. It looked like somewhere folks might go to cast a line from time to time. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing. Unless you took in the whole scene. There, splayed amongst the dirt, bits of fabric. Kellen's neon green t-shirt hung half in and half out of the creek, snagged on a jutting rock, the bottom hem stained a deep dark red. I recognized the shirt instantly. He'd only packed the one. Just a few feet away, trampled into the ground, were Kellen's sunglasses and hat. Scattered about, I could only pick out small items. Bits of metal. Pieces of plastic that may have been part of a pocket knife. And more cloth. Too much cloth. Kellen was gone, and from the looks of things, he hadn't left willingly. I barely felt my knees give way as I staggered back into the undergrowth. Something wasn't right. Nothing felt right about this. Every bit of my being screamed it. No bear, cougar, or other forest-dwelling predator would attack like this. It all seemed planned, methodical even. Something out there, some person, had snatched my friend. But why? This thought sent a fresh wave of sickening fear coursing through me. If they'd gone after Kellen with those intentions, it wouldn't be long before they got wind of me. I had to get out of there. There was a ranger station. I couldn't be all that far from the trailhead. Surely someone could help. Turning blindly, I broke into a desperate run back towards the sound of the creek. It became a guide a way forward from the horrors I couldn't allow myself to dwell on. My lungs burned, each desperate gasp mingling with sobs threatening to burst. Every twisted root in my path held the potential for me to go face first into the tangled ground. Every snap of a twig sent a fresh stab of panic through me. Then, a sound that wasn't natural. Something big, moving through the brush ahead. A figure stepped out, blocking my path, and my body came to a shuddering halt. He was immense, easily seven feet tall, though hunched over in a posture that would be impossible for most men. 
His clothes were ragged, patched together in a mismatch of browns and rough denim. An old hunter's cap crowned his head, greasy strands of his dark hair peeking out at odd angles. But that wasn't what registered most immediately. No, it was the weathered leather, stretched, twisted, and formed into a mask covering his entire face. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but warped contours and tanned hide. I couldn't breathe, could barely scream, just stared in abject terror. Suddenly, he lunged. I turned with a strangled cry, legs finally taking action after the initial fear froze me in place. Every sound magnified now, the crunch of damp leaves under my pounding feet, the whistling of my breaths, the distant howl of a dog back toward the road. He followed close behind, the gap never seeming to widen. With some burst of animal energy, I managed to reach the road and scramble into the driver's seat of the RV. He appeared as suddenly as I felt the keys drop from my fingers and clatter behind a pedal. His hulking frame was practically pressed against the window as I tried to fumble for the ignition. Finally, the engine whined to life. Slamming the RV into drive, I stomped the gas, a desperate lurch nearly sending me careening into the dense forest on the other side of the road. That summer ended forever in that single moment. We never found Kellen, or any explanation for what happened in those deep woods. For months, maybe even years after, I refused to speak of it, even to myself. And now I wonder what happened to the leather-masked monstrosity. It couldn't have stayed confined to that wilderness forever. Did it claim more victims? Does it stalk the dark forests still? It chills me to think about, and to wonder if my path will ever cross with those shadowed trees and that towering figure waiting beneath them once again. It was during one of those mild October nights when the air holds a hint of autumn chill yet refuses to submit entirely to the impending winter. My car had broken down, and in an obscure part of California, finding help or any kind of cellular signal seemed like a fool's errand. I was returning from an off-site job interview when it happened. Murphy's Law seemed to be at full force that evening as I got out and started walking up a deserted road, hoping to find some assistance. An hour into my trek, I came across what appeared to be an abandoned gas station. The place must have seen better days because it was now barely holding up against the ravages of time. Nonetheless, there were some cars parked outside, a peculiar sight for such a dilapidated structure. I proceeded cautiously toward it, hoping the group of people who seemingly frequented this eerie place could lend a helping hand. As I approached the entrance, I noticed faint laughter in the distance, its echoes bouncing from wall to wall. My heart started pounding heavily against my chest as I stepped inside. I found myself in a large open room with deteriorating furniture scattered about. The source of the laughter turned out to be two preteen children seated towards the corner of this chamber, oblivious to my entrance. Both had jet black eyes and maintained sinister grins on their faces as they conversed with each other. The girl looked up at me first, almost as if she sensed my presence before actually seeing me. She nudged her companion, who then turned his attention towards me as well. Hey there, what brings you here? The boy spoke first, his voice unnervingly shrill for his age. Yeah, added the girl cheerfully. Weren't you expecting us? I just need some help with my car, I responded cautiously while trying not to make direct eye contact with those black orbs they called eyes. Well, you've come to the right place, the boy said, jumping to his feet. We'll help you out. But you gotta play a game with us first. Yeah, it'll be fun, the girl chimed in. I tried to calm my nerves by cracking a feeble joke. What's next? Are we going to summon the spirits or something? The two kids exchanged glances and burst into laughter. Not quite, said the boy, wiping tears from his eyes. Now, the rules are simple. If you win, 
will assist with your car. Otherwise, he paused for effect, you have to do us a favor. My skepticism got the better of me, but after a short deliberation, I agreed to their proposition. The game seemed harmless enough, guessing which hand concealed a coin. With that, I picked the girl's left hand. Very well, she responded with her grin widening. Let's go. We walked out of the gas station back into the dark night as they led me further down an even more remote path. I questioned myself about trusting these strange children when we eventually stopped at an old well. Here's where we strike our bargain, announced the boy ominously. A shiver crept up my spine at this point. Their intentions were becoming clearer. It was some form of macabre agreement where I played into their hands. A sharp cry pierced my thoughts as a man suddenly emerged from behind a tree and charged at me with a cudgel clenched in his hands. I tried shouting for assistance but was unable to muster more than a hoarse whisper amidst the disarray. As the man charged at me, I desperately looked around for something to use in my defense. The two kids had vanished, leaving me alone to deal with this sudden attack. The man's face was contorted in pure rage, sweat dripping down his brow and eyes bloodshot. He seemed unstoppable, fueled by an unthinkable fury. In my panic, I stumbled backward and tripped over a fallen tree branch. My heart raced as I scrambled back to my feet, just as the man was about to strike me with the cudgel. I barely managed to dodge his swing, which landed heavily on the ground beside me. Get away from here, he bellowed as he readied himself for another attack. I knew that I couldn't overpower him or try to reason with him there, so my only option was to run and find help. Please, I don't want any trouble, I pleaded as I looked for an escape route. The man paid no mind to my pleas and lunged at me again. This time, however, I saw an opening and sprinted past him towards the gas station for help. My lungs burned and my legs ached as I pushed myself harder than I ever had before. It felt like an eternity before the lights of the gas station finally emerged ahead of me. Bursting through the gas station doors, I gasped for breath and begged the attendant behind the counter, Help! There's a man chasing me! Can you please call the police? The attendant hurriedly grabbed his phone and began dialing for help while keeping an eye on the entrance in case my pursuer followed. Within minutes, flashing blue lights appeared in the distance as a pair of police cars sped toward us. The officers quickly took statements from both myself and the attendant before setting off in search of my attacker. While waiting for news, it dawned on me that those kids had purposefully led me to the well, likely knowing full well what kind of danger awaited me there. I couldn't quite understand their motives, and neither could the police, who admitted that they had never come across such a bizarre case in all their years working in law enforcement. As the police continued to question me, I suddenly heard the distant sound of sirens approaching. I turned my head to see a battered and bloody figure being escorted into an ambulance. It was my attacker. He had been caught. An officer approached me and confirmed what I had suspected. They'd captured the man who tried to harm me, and he'd sustained significant injuries during his pursuit by the police. As relief washed over me, I couldn't help but question why those kids had set me up in such a dangerous situation. Their eerie grins and unnerving demeanor had left their mark on me, but for now, all I could do was be grateful that I'd managed to escape with my life. Once the whole ordeal was over, I silently made my way back to my car. It was no longer about fixing it. All I wanted now was for it to work just enough so that it could take me far away from that gas station and those two sinister children. I wouldn't forget their faces or what transpired that night. It would serve as a chilling reminder that not everything is as it seems, and there are forces beyond our understanding at play. As for the man who attacked me, I wondered if he too fell victim to those children's twisted game. With every passing day since that fateful night, I vowed never to involve myself in unknown situations with sinister characters ever again.
Ever have one of those days where everything goes sideways before you've even finished your first cup of coffee? That was my reality, just a few ticks past sunrise, as I clocked in at the secluded facility nestled discreetly within the dense cover of Montana's Lolo National Forest. My name, not that it matters much amongst the covert circles I run in, is Ripley Voss. I'm a biologist, but not the garden variety kind. I work on genetic experiments so secret tea, even mentioning them too loud, might warrant a stern visit from uptight suits. The day began like any other. I was triple-checking sequence alignments when Harlan Coates, our tech guru with the fingers of a concert pianist and the hair of a wild man, stormed in. Ripley, he gasped. Delphine found something gruesome on the west perimeter. Delphine Pratchett, ever the stoic field operative, rarely flinched at anything nature threw her way. We geared up quickly, matching black cargo pants and sturdy boots, whispering across linoleum as we paced through sterile corridors. Outside, the sun was too bashful to pierce the fortified pines, shielding us from prying eyes. Delphine met us by the main gate, her expression grim. Follow me she said curtly. We didn't need more prodding than that. By the time we reached what Delphine had discovered, the first whispers of horror were already unfurling within me, a sight as disgusting as it was baffling. A deer sprawled across our path but mangled in such bizarre fashion that it looked more like a cruel parody of taxidermy gone wrong. Harlan quipped an inappropriate joke about venison going to waste, inappropriate being his brand. But nobody laughed. We all felt it. Something wasn't right. With Harlan mumbling to himself and Delphine scanning for more clues, neither daring to verbalize their dread, I crouched down beside the carcass for a closer inspection. No ordinary predator had wrought this devastation. No human could achieve such precision with such savagery. Suddenly aware of how exposed we stood in a swatch of forest far away from any semblance of safety, I stood up briskly and checked my sidearm, a habit drilled into me over years on this unorthodox job. Not that a gun always helped against what nature might dream up. I don't like this, Delphine muttered, reaching for her own weapon discreetly concealed beneath her jacket. Let's report back, I suggested, when suddenly an ear-splitting roar shattered our uneasy conference, a sound no known creature could claim rights to. We turned instinctively toward its source, hearts impaled by primal fear as incongruent thoughts collided in our minds. Was this linked to our experiments? A byproduct of our tamperings we hadn't foreseen? The arsenal under our fingertips provided cold comfort against unknown monstrosities born from nature's wrath or perhaps our own arrogance. Pushing through branches that snagged at us with spider-like fingers, we sought sight of whatever beast owned that harrowing cry. Just then, Coates yelped as his foot found vacuous earth where solid ground should be. He staggered, but recovered quick enough not to kiss the dirt face first. It wasn't long before we came upon another chilling scene, one more hapless animal distorted beyond recognition, but this time with evidence suggesting an intelligent yet feral perpetrator at play. The air turned heavy with silent apprehension as daylight began its retreat, a tactical failure on our part, not securing the area before dusk crept upon us. Our hand signals spoke volumes. Spread out, but stay within eyeshot. The difficulty being every shadow now seemed pregnant with malice waiting to breach its umbra cage. I scanned every visual frame my eyes could capture fearing a repeat of literature's fabled wendigos or skinwalkers. Though my rational mind screamed there had to be logic behind these perverted displays, nature usually didn't dabble in modern horror mythos. We pressed on, keeping close but cautious of ambush. Sanchez motioned for a retreat back to the base. The need for reinforcements was clear as our numbers and weaponry were inadequate for confrontation. Signals crackled to life in our radios. Henderson spoke first. Base, we have an unknown hostile, 
Request immediate backup at our coordinates. Static hissed a response. Copy that. ETA 20 minutes. Panic held us when branches snapped nearby. I sighted the outline of something large and swift among the trees. Body lean and powerful, covered with matted fur like a bear, but movements too graceful, too predatory. Coates signaled from a distance, pointing to a lower clearing. Look. I followed his gesture, noting body parts stretched between trees. We knew then what had screamed earlier. An animal, or even worse. Human met its end. Our circle tightened as darkness grew near. Lights flickered on weapons and headgear revealing further shredded foliage and traces of blood leading deeper into the forest. No one spoke. The reality spoke for itself. The wait for reinforcements became a haunting vigil. A shape darted between shadows, silent except for faint rustles betraying its position. It happened in seconds. Coates screamed as the creature leaped. Claws sliced through the air as he fired blindly. I saw it then in full view, limbs disproportionate in length, giving advantage in both reach and speed against its prey. Eyes reflected haunting red glints from our lights. Chaos ensued as bullets found their mark, but not sufficiently to deter the creature's onslaught on coats. Realization dawned. This creature wasn't just defending territory. It hunted us, methodically. Sanchez shouted orders above gunfire noise. Fall back to the clearing. Keep your sights aligned. We retreated in formation, while the creature pursued relentlessly. Injuries mounted among us. Henderson took a severe blow trying to cover our escape. Reinforcements arrived with louder gunfire and brighter lights pushing the beast back into shadows that birthed it. Regrouped at base, we accounted for losses. Henderson didn't make it out alive. Beside his fate lay heavy on our minds. The next day brought armed teams and trackers combing through detailed reports at hand. No sign of the beast except torn environs speaking silently of its reign of terror. Debriefings followed with experts proposing theories on possible species variants or mutations caused by natural anomaly or human intervention gone wrong. We kept silent vigils, weapons primed not knowing whether the creature lay in wait or if we'd invaded its solitary domain, triggering its savage defense mechanism. In end, my thoughts often circle back to these woods and what might still lurk within. A predator's no folklore or story could ever have envisioned yet undeniably real in nature's twisted scheme or our folly. This happened to me on July 4th, 1999. I still remember the fireworks crackling overhead, folks laughing at the campground down the ridge. Me? I never much cared for big crowds. That's the whole reason I moved out here, up into the Ozarks. Figured a man could find peace, solitude. That's why I built this cabin with my own two hands. I'm Jared, by the way. Been living this way ten years now. Got myself a little garden, rainwater catchment, solar panels for when I need them. I go into town once a month, stock up on the essentials. Other than that, it's just me and the trees. Well... Until that night, there'd been weird things happening for a while. Supplies going missing, strange noises I couldn't place. At first, I chalked it up to a mountain lion or some other critter. But then one morning, I found footprints, big ones, size of a dinner plate. But the shape, it wasn't like any animal I recognized. The toes, there were only four of them, and they were long and crooked-like. That's when I started getting the prickling at the back of my neck. That feeling like I wasn't alone out here anymore. July 4th comes around. Town down the mountain is shooting off those blasted fireworks. I'm hunkered down, trying to ignore the racket when I hear it. A sort of crunching sound, like heavy footsteps on the dry leaves circling my cabin. I froze. My heart pounded so loud I thought whatever was out there would hear it. I had my old man's rifle within reach, a Winchester, handed down through generations. I eased it up, 
finger on the trigger, and peered out a window. The fireworks cast strange, flickering shadows. But there, clear as anything between the trees, was a massive figure. It moved hunched over, those long clawed feet padding softly in the dirt. Hard to make out every detail, but the thing was huge, well over seven feet tall. Its skin looked thick and leathery. The head seemed too small for the body, long and pointed with these glowing yellow eyes. It circled my cabin like a wolf sniffing out its prey. A low growl echoed through the night, rumbling up from its chest. I'd never heard anything like it. This wasn't any mountain lion. This was something else. Something unnatural. I spent that night pressed against the wall, rifle ready, the sweat dripping off me. Every creak, every rustle of leaves had me jumping. But the creature didn't attack. Morning came, the fireworks long silent, and I crept outside. I could see its tracks all around my place, and the gouges in a tree trunk where it sharpened its claws. Whatever it was, it had been watching me. Now some folks might have packed up and left. But this is my land, the cabin I built. I wasn't about to be chased out by some... some beast... I patched up the damage and doubled down on my defenses. Sharpened stakes, dug trenches, turned my home into a fortress. Life became a waiting game. The creature seemed to be biding its time. I caught glimpses of it in the woods, the eyes always watching. At night, I'd hear the growls, sometimes so close it felt like the thing was right outside my door. The fear gnawed at me. It wasn't just the threat... It was the not knowing. What the hell was it? Why me? The breaking point came a few weeks later. I was in town stocking up when I ran into old man Tucker at the general store. Tucker was a gossip, but he had a good heart. I ended up telling him, some of it at least. Couldn't bring myself to spill the craziest stuff. Tucker listened, scratched his beard, then his eyes went wide. Jared... He whispered, I think I know what you've seen out there. He told me stories, handed down from his grandpappy's time. Stories about creatures living deep in the hills. Ancient things, best left alone. Folks used to call it the Howling Man. Some even said it wasn't an animal at all, maybe a demon. Well, I always thought those were just tall tales. But sitting there in that cluttered store... Tucker's voice low and urgent. I felt the chill settle in my bones. When I got back to my cabin that night, it felt different. Empty. I knew I wasn't alone anymore. Days turned into weeks. I hardly slept. The pressure was crushing. One morning I woke up and something had snapped inside of me. I took down my Winchester, loaded it, and walked into the woods. Wasn't about hunting the thing. I knew that was a fool's errand, but I couldn't live like that anymore, waiting for the axe to fall. I tracked the creature for hours. I found scat, torn up animal carcasses, signs it was close. Each track sent a shiver down my spine. The woods felt oppressive, like the air itself was holding its breath. Finally, as the sun dipped below the trees, I saw it. The creature stood in a clearing, its back to me. It had something in its massive claws, a deer, freshly torn apart. The smell of blood made me gag. My legs started trembling, but a sort of cold fury washed over me. I raised the rifle, steadied my aim on its broad back. This was it. One way or another, this was going to end today. My finger tightened on the trigger, and then it turned. The yellow eyes locked onto me. It dropped the carcass, a guttural snarl vibrating through the trees. The creature charged, covering the distance with terrifying speed. I fired once, twice, but the bullet seemed to bounce right off its thick hide. Panic fueled me. I turned and ran, the trees a blur around me. I could hear it gaining, the thud of its feet like thunder. A fallen log tripped me up, sent me sprawling. Pain shot through my ankle. When I looked up, the thing was almost on top of me. I scrambled back, 
raised the rifle like a club. The creature swiped down with a gnarled claw, the blow glancing off the gun and sending it flying. Pain exploded across my chest, and I cried out as I was thrown against a tree, my vision blurring. The howling man loomed over me. Its mouth opened, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. I braced for the killing blow, but it didn't come. The creature tilted its long head, the yellow eyes narrowing as if it was studying me. Then, with a frustrated grunt, it turned and lumbered back into the woods, disappearing into the shadows. I lay there, gasping for air, my whole body on fire. I didn't know why the thing had spared me. Maybe I was just a disappointment as a meal, all skin and bones compared to a deer. Or maybe it had something crueler in mind. It took me hours to drag myself back to the cabin. My ankle was throbbing and my ribs felt cracked. But I was alive. The howling man could have ended it, and it didn't. From then on, the game changed. The attacks became more frequent, more daring. One night, it ripped the door clean off its hinges, though I managed to drive it back with fire. Another morning, I found the mangled corpse of my neighbor's hunting dog on the edge of my property. A message, clear as day. Fear became my constant companion. I barely ate, barely slept. Every crack in the walls of my cabin felt like those yellow eyes watching me. I tried to reach out for help, but who would believe my tales of monsters in the night? They'd lock me up, thinking me mad. Weeks turned into months. The isolation, the endless stress, it was tearing me apart. I started talking to myself, just to hear a human voice. Some days I'd even find myself laughing at some half-forgotten joke. I knew I was slipping away. One morning, a Tuesday I think, though the days had no meaning anymore, I woke up to silence. Not even the birds were singing. Something was wrong. I crept to the window, heart pounding. The clearing around my cabin was littered with bodies. Torn limbs, shattered bones, so much blood soaking the earth. A cold horror swept through me. These weren't animals. Hikers, I realized with a sick dread. Maybe a family lost on a trail. And there, amidst the carnage, stood the howling man. It was feasting. I watched in revulsion as it tore into the remains, its yellow eyes gleaming with a terrible satisfaction. That was it. The final straw. All those months, I'd clung to some shred of hope, a fool's belief that I could just wait it out. I couldn't anymore. This... this thing wasn't just hunting me. It was enjoying it. It was going to keep killing until I stopped it, or it stopped me. I went down to my shed and pulled out the old gas cans. There had to be a better way to fight fire than my measly torch. When night fell, I soaked the ground around the cabin, the walls, everything. I rigged up a contraption with a long string leading inside. All it needed was a spark. Then I sat and waited. The creature came, drawn by the scent of blood. It circled my home, let out a roar that made the windows rattle. I gripped the string, my hand shaking. This was suicide, plain and simple. But it was the only choice I had left. With a sob that turned into a battle cry, I yanked the string. The fuse caught, and the world erupted in flames. The cabin went up like a tinderbox. The howling man screamed, a sound I'll hear in my nightmares until the day I die. It thrashed around engulfed in the inferno. I stumbled out, coughing and choking on the smoke, my skin blistering from the heat. I collapsed on the edge of the clearing and watched. The flames roared, consuming my home, my sanctuary, everything I had. And from within that blazing hell, the creature's screams echoed until finally, mercifully, they stopped. The aftermath was a blur. The fire spread took out a chunk of the woods before the rangers managed to contain it. I was found half delirious, mumbling about monsters. They airlifted me to a hospital. Severe burns, smoke inhalation, and a fractured ankle. The doctors patched me up as best they could, even gave me something for the nightmares. 
but some wounds don't heal so easily. The official story is that I started the fire myself. Accident, they said. Maybe sparked by faulty wiring. Or they hinted at mental illness brought on by the isolation. They looked at me with pity in their eyes, those city folk doctors. They didn't understand. Sometimes the real monsters aren't the ones in your nightmares. Sometimes they're the ones telling you it was all just in your head, 